If you've seen the other parts, you get bragging rights in the comments. But if you haven't, go watch them right now. You wanna know something? Deathmatch will eventually turn 10 years old by the end of this season. Of course, you'd want to try and do something special for an upcoming season, but for now, I'd say that we have followed Death Battle long enough to see a noteworthy change in the formula. Dailies and Mental Gin, welcome to Modern Death Battle! This term has been thrown around quite a bit, it's often used to refer to seasons 5 and onward, but mm, can you really call them modern at this point? Others would simply refer to it as the current season, and I think that's a little too obvious. In my opinion, Season 7 is the true beginning of modern death battle. I say this because Season 7 was where it truly started to feel like a Rooster Teeth show instead of a classic screw attack show. Yes, the merge happened in Season 6, but it still felt like it maintained its old screw attack identity. But by Season 7, Rooster Teeth's influence was taking full effect. More episodes would be coming out, waiting periods would be two weeks instead of three, and a lot more mainstream characters would be chosen. Makes you wonder what people thought about this, don't it? New changes and tones don't have to be bad, but it makes the show feel way different than the older seasons. Rooster Teeth may have been great for Screw Attack, but as far as Modern Death Battle's debut goes, yeah, this was quite a divisive start, wasn't it? Season 7 is arguably the most mixed season of the show. People were highly critical of a select number of episodes to a point where it feeling different from every other season was a bad thing. Many people claim that the show felt sterile, or soulless even, as if there wasn't a lot of passion or care put into these episodes, and all of the charm from the previous seasons was lost. Good luck trying to convince me going off of its season premiere. Mainly because Miles vs. Static was the debut of a brand new animation style. I'm not sure if there's a technical term for it since I'm not an animator, but it's often dubbed as puppet animation! The thing about previous sprite episodes is that as good and fun as they can be, they still felt hindered by the sprite sheets. Not all of them were expressive or dynamic enough to create fluid animations. This is probably why you'd always see sprite fights using the MVC style, be it sprites from the games themselves or custom sprites that is directly based on on that style. But with puppet animation, you can have more distinct sprites doing more elaborate animations. And what better way to introduce this animation style than with the matchup where both characters are Did you just use a race connection unironically? Before getting into the analyses, let's talk about these new designs of Wiz and Boomstick. Oof. Wiz's mouth looks like it's positioned incorrectly, Boomstick's dimples look way too big, I don't remember them being this rough. But to be fair, they were immediately cleaned up by the next episode. But still, looking at them back to back, you swear that they were in different seasons. <laughs> but if you want my take on these new designs, overall I prefer old Wiz and new Boomstick. I do understand why the redesigns exist in the first place, because, like with puppet animations, the new Wiz and Boomstick designs are animated more fluidly and dynamically so that you can get a lot more creative with expressions and posing. The designs look like they were more in line with two hosts just standing here and talking about characters. Back then, the most you would have is, like, they would alter Boomstick's eyes or something. Whereas with these new designs, they have a lot more freedom with how they're animated. Even just the moments where they go, HE'S WIZ AND I'M BOOMSTICK! You get all sorts of elaborate animations animations, and even some epic dynamic duo posing. Seriously, I adore these poses so much, you have no idea. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, now talk about the episode. Well, the analyses don't have too much to talk about, unfortunately. I mean, I guess I like the $30,000 hamburger joke, and like, eight legs, four times the walking power. Gee, I wonder why that's so topical. And they actually scale another Spider-Man to Peter Parker. Kind of wish Miguel got this too, but, uh, whatever. And I guess I was kind of surprised to hear Boomstick saying, IT'S GOING IN RAW! Brenda is a child, she should not be saying that kind of stuff. The only other thing worth mentioning is that they show a lot of Spider-Verse in what's supposed to be comic book Miles. I know that Spider-Verse is what Miles is most known for, and to be fair, they kind of do the same thing with Virgil for his cartoon series. That's all fine and dandy with me, so long as they stick to using it as a visual guide for their stories. But here they just use a feat from Spider-Verse, and it's like, like, um, that's not the Miles you're supposed to be scaling? Why not focus on comic book feats from Miles? I don't know. It's, it's really weird. Virgil's analysis was better at least. The classic sitcom bully. 
No teenage story is complete without it. I mean, Miles didn't have one, but okay. They go over things like the Dakotaverse and Static's comic history. Those were neat. And then we get to see their alternate universe counterparts, and they're canonically named Jizz and Broomstick, which is a nice nod to Meta vs. Carolina. Introducing Jizz and Broomstick! It's Wiz and Boomstick. Aside from that, the analysis was also just alright. An improvement, but you just went from okay to okay. And people say the same thing about the fight, and um... Are you sure about that? This is a better season premiere than He-Man vs. lion -O. Aside from the setup, it's pretty rushed because it somehow managed to find a compromise between a fight in media res and a fight with a setup. This was not intentional, so how'd you manage that? <laughs> Whatever, let's talk about the puppet animation and how it differs from other sprite fights. Or maybe I don't need to because I'd assume you can see, right? But just in case you can't, these poses look very dynamic. The thing about puppet animation in Death Battle is that instead of animating the whole sprite, they tend to animate the individual limbs. While they're clearly doing that, you'd swear that the sprite sheets are just like this. Very nice rigging with dynamic poses and fluid animations. With special shoutouts to Miles lifting up a chunk of the floor and then kicking it at static, and of course, the shoulder tap. Also, dabs are still funny, cry about it. This episode is chock full of other Spider-Verse references as well, like the spider sense being in the same style, the varying colors, and some direct references to the movie. But thankfully, this isn't just the Miles show, not even half a percent close. As Virgil gets to use his powers to adapt to Miles' speed and abilities while also not fully outclassing Miles. Yes, the conclusion did say Virgil could theoretically do that, but they put in the extra effort to making it even, and waited until the final minute of the fight to demonstrate that. And the build-up to it feels natural. Like this part, where Miles destroys his main method of movement and even cuts off his arm. This forces Virgil to reattach it with his energy, like they said he could do in the analysis. And there's also this line. Okay, you've got surprises, but so do I. Which you think would be a compliment, but this is where he starts using abilities that are more harmful for Miles and his arsenal. Ending with a climax where Virgil uses his electricity to manipulate Miles. It's a smart move that even leads to an amusing exchange that shows how Static is completely out of his league. The visuals also make the choreography even better. The lighting effects look really nice, the nighttime setting helps them pop, and their electric auras and even their costumes stand out more in this setting. Plus the city rooftops at nighttime is surprisingly kind of a rare environment for Death Battle. Like, I'm genuinely surprised that this hasn't been used more often, but hey, helps this one stand out even more, am I right? But what really makes this episode go from good to great is the track. What's up, danger? Ah! is one of the most underrated tracks of the entire show. I know I say that a lot, but in my defense, this is actually kind of true. It's a collaboration between JT Music, Omega Spart, and SWAT, who followed me on Twitter very recently. I don't know why. I like how it's played like an actual rap battle and goes back and forth when one combatant gets the upper hand. That's just a clever use of scoring right there. This track goes all out with the crunk early 2000s style of hip hop, which believe it or not, I actually kind of grew up with. So seeing it fit the style this well is very cathartic for me. And as for the lyrics, well just check out Swartz's flow right here, my dude. Venomous gun and electric in front of me, you and the to my senses, they tickle in insulation is a valid defense and a drop of water, I'm about to dispense. You the Damn! Go off! <laughs> oh, and I especially love the harmonization he uses. It's just so satisfying to hear when he does it. Especially when the chorus plays a second time. Oh, and as for Omega Sparks' lyrics for Static? <laughs> Dude! Oh my god! Okay, there's mopping the floor with someone, and then there's stepping in loser, and then there's grinding your foot into their face to the beat of Rumor Has It by Adele! So yeah, in case you couldn't tell, this is my favorite track of the season, and yes, I know what's coming soon, and I still stand by that. Wonder how this is gonna go down with other people. But then we get to the death. It's also good. You don't know what you're talking about. Sure, it may just be another generic explosion death, but it has good build-up, good sound design and impact, pretty visuals, and a good death scream. Very B-tier, but I'm the type of person who says B-tier equals good. I also like the touch of Virgil using the debris from when he tried to crush Miles to prevent him from hitting the pavement. So yeah, for an episode that people say doesn't have too much to talk about, I sure did find a lot to talk about. 86 out of 100. You might think that's a high score, but I like fights with a distinct personality to it. It's not that deep.
Alright, who let Death Battle Fanon pick another matchup? Okay, as much as I dislike Mortal Kombat, I have to admit, I think Zendel is a really cool character. But in terms of being one of the teased characters for Season 7, could you really not find a better opponent than one where the connection is- uh... I'll admit that Canary's analysis was more interesting than I thought it would be. A lot of talk about her mother's legacy and the team she joined and even took charge of. They also tackled her, uh, screaming abilities decently well. But the jokes were peak, unfunny, and almost painful, but not quite. Though Boomstick tried his hardest to be a cringe Luddite, and I don't like that. Sindel's analysis was slightly better. Just slightly. Not gonna lie, Wiz. What the hell did you just say? Though it does have that weird cutaway where Boomstick randomly has Sub-Zeros and Cabal's skulls when Subby won his episode and Cabal still doesn't have an episode yet. Also, am I the only person who thinks that her ending note is rushed? Like, they give one sentence that covers the different timelines, says she's a queen, and then end the rundown right then and there. Who needs good pacing when you have screaming, I guess? But let's get on to the fight, and Liam has said that this is his worst material, though he still doesn't think it's bad. You know what? He does have a point. If anything, I'd argue this is his best work. The dialogue in this episode is unparalleled. I mean, they have Shao Kahn as the fight announcer. That is peak. And it works so seamlessly, brilliantly, because the fight is set up in a Mortal Kombat tournament, with Sindel supposedly being the next combatant. And as for the opening exchange, cannot be improved. I love how it basically starts off as, Another human from the human realm has decided to cut us off like an asshat. And then Dinah's all right, ah. Who cares? Whatever. Let's just fight already. And then Shao Kahn's like, FIGHT! Once again, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant reference for death battle boomers like myself. And then we have this exchange where Dinah knocks her out and says, Okay, so, uh, a ring like a thing here? Cause, um, I'm pretty sure that I just knocked her the f out. But then Sindel shows up and says, Insufferable creature! This is a death battle! Which means that we have to fight to the death until one of us dies! And then Dinah's like, Oh no, that's not good. Then of course, you have the greatest exchange of the entire episode, if not the entire show. Such a pretty bird with such an ugly sound. Tell me, can you fly? Because I am going to make you fly. Because the ones who cannot fly are sentenced to breed slave for the rest of eternity. And then Dinah's all like, ah, I'm not interested in breeding slaves. Oliver and I already have a kid. Now anyways, I'm going to deep throat my fist into your mouth. And then I'm going to switch sides, which somehow decapitates you. Yes, queen, fatality. <laughs> Okay, I think I might be going a little too far here because this is almost like mocking someone for their work and I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I gotta speak objectively with this one. Let's talk about the visuals. Previously, I've said that Optimus Prime vs. Gundam had some of the best lighting of the entire show, and that Ganondorf vs. Dracula has some of the best effects and visuals of the show, but you know what? This episode is better than all of those combined. They turned Sindel into Felicia from Darkstalkers. I mean, yeah, her hands are positioned a little differently, but look, it's the same sprite! That is peak! And Dinah's sprite? Easily the best one in the entire series. Watch her take a selfie. Hey. Dinah's eyebrows solo every single visual in the VFX industry, and I kind of hate the fact that you can unironically make that argument. <laughs> in case you couldn't tell, this episode kind of broke me a bit. <laughs> But this is a legitimate video, it's not April 1st, I gotta be realistic with this one. In actuality, this animation's not very good, but if we were to go off of how much fun I was having with this episode, I would legitimately give this a 99 out of 100, exclusively based on how much fun I had revisiting it. I'm serious, I was laughing that hard. But settle down and be realistic here. The visuals are not that good, the animation has so many bad moments, some that are too slow, some that are too fast, some that are both too slow and too fast at the same time, this hand-drawn section that exists for no reason, the death makes no sense, the dialogue is funny but overwritten and you'd be hard-pressed to anyone trying to say it's unironically good. Oh, and also, ribs get broken, doesn't care, leg cracks a little bit, screams in pain. It was pretty cool to see the scream bombs, but that's the only moment I like unironically. Black Canary vs. Sindel, which from now on I will refer to as Blindary, it's not a very good episode, but I had fun with it. 37 out of 100. Never thought I'd get to see Death Battle's equivalent of the room, but life do be full of surprises, I guess.
At long last, we finally get that Ninja Turtle vs Power Ranger matchup that Ben had always wanted since Season 1. And it begins with Boomstick eating cereal with stock crunching sound effects. How interesting. Going into Leonardo's analysis, I like how they finally learned to composite the Ninja Turtles properly, giving Leo everything that's not too far out of the ordinary, and focusing on feats from those series as well. I even kinda liked Wiz being skeptical about a turtle being in any way fast. And since he's a turtle, Leo's got super speed and super strength. I'm not sure the science checks out on that one. Which we'll be called back to with a line from Boomstick. Ha! I knew the turtles were slow. But then again, they also do have this line. And Michelangelo? Well, we all know he got dropped as a kid. Why would you ever want to make a callback to that part of the Battle Royale? As for Jason's analysis, I do wish it was as fun as the older Power Ranger rundowns, but since Jason isn't using a mech, it feels refreshing to hear his martial arts feats properly covered for once. We get to see different feats, different abilities, and lots about what the Rangers are able to do on the ground. It's a cool analysis that, in spite of not having too many good jokes, has some interesting tidbits to make up for it. And then we go on to the fight, and did Jason's foot need to be hand-drawn like that? Nah, yeah, whatever. But then again, you have Leonardo eating one slice of pizza. Look, I know my New York slices. They can be as big as your head, especially when you go to like a shopping mall or something. But that doesn't usually stop a turtle from eating a full pizza at once. It also doesn't make sense for Leonardo being out in the open without a disguise. And I'm not sure how I feel about Jason assuming that Leo is one of Rita's monsters. I know that she does have a turtle monster in Jason's continuity, but surely Leo wouldn't resist assemble it that well, would he? Anyways, that's all my criticism for the episode, so let's get into the good stuff. Kagi is once again back as Jason, and he does just as good of a job as he did in Megazord vs Voltron. Honestly, it feels like he does a better job because he has a lot more lines to work with. John Allen's Leonardo is also great. Captures the campy feel of classic Ninja Turtles excellently. A few of his lines do sound more akin to something Mikey would do, but from what I've seen of the Rise series, it's not as dissimilar to how Leo is portrayed in that show as you might think. But as for the animation... <laughs> I really like how extra the choreography is. Of course you have things like Leo reflecting a laser with his shell, but also with moments like Leo doing all sorts of flips and spins just because he can. And the dialogue feels like it was ripped straight out of a Saturday morning cartoon. Moments like Leo cringing at Jason's bad pun, and Leonardo bragging about the immortal turtle, followed by Jason's hilarious response. That's bogus! says the guy who just pulled a Glock. I also like Leo's meditation scene where he chucks the pothole lid to buy him some time and then pulls out the Odachi sword to escape just before Jason arrives at the sewer. That's a nice attention to detail I didn't notice. And then we have the final clash. Kagi's war cry is phenomenal, the kill has explosions, and the blood dripping into the sewers feels like a callback to the TMNT battle royale since Leo is finally f***ing dead. And it's also a pretty nifty shot. Oh, and let's talk about the track. Teenage Morphin Ninja Power. Absolutely fantastic and assuredly one of my favorites of the season. They go with an 8-bit theme and mix it with an edge of punk rock that gives it an arcadey feel perfect for some cheesy 80s cartoon goodness. And while this doesn't have that much to do with the track, I think that the environment really helps to sell the same vibe. And you might be thinking that it's just another city at night aesthetic, and yes, I am a huge sucker for that aesthetic, but it's a lot more detailed than you'd think. Not only does the brick architecture look on point, but it's surprisingly varied in terms of colors. Maybe they were using some already existing assets, but at the the same time, they could have just copy pasted the same building texture and called it an environment, and you could try to justify it given the tight production schedule that I will be semi elaborating on later. But no, whether it be in the lights, the walls, the tiles, or even the interior of the buildings from the glass doors, each one has a different color. Mainly warm colors like some oranges, yellows, and sunset purples. But since I'm something of a retro games enthusiast as well as a big city enjoyer, I outspokenly appreciate this level of detail. It's not full on synthwave or anything. Anything, but it's definitely enough to sell the environments you'd find in that vibe. I'm not sure who worked on all of these buildings, but all I have to say to those people is BODACIOUS! And to think that this is yet another episode that people say doesn't have a lot to talk about, what are you talking about? It's cool if you take more issues with the episode than I do, but personally, it's a lot more than good. It's an 88 out of 100. Yes, I do prefer Shredder vs. Silver Samurai, but this one is the most Ninja Turtles episode I have seen, and as a fan of the show, I mean that in the best way. Although this constant back and forth in quality is giving me some season 2 vibes for some reason. <laughs> 
Ah, there it is. Can't feel like we're in the first few seasons of Death Battle if we don't have a sh house of a matchup this early on in the season. But in their defense, Genos had literally nothing better, and a good chunk of his opponents were in fact from Marvel and DC. But as for the episode, the general opinion seems to go all over the place with people. Some love it, some hate it, some are neutral. I feel like being a contrary again, but I feel like that's impossible in this case. But let's see what it's all like. Like Genos! This is not Super Mario RPG. Pronounce it correctly. Also, they use law and order sound effects unironically. Why? And the pacing of this analysis feels really weird. Genos is one of my favorite characters from OPM, but I feel like they rushed into his story really fast. No joke, the most I got from this analysis was Wiz's delivery of Ew. Ew. I don't know, I just think the delivery makes it funny. And War Machines is somehow the same case. It feels like they rush into it even faster. At least Genos had something of a segue for his backstory. Rhodey doesn't even get that. On top of having a cutaway that makes no sense. What's the joke? What's funny about this? Outside of that, I'd say that Rhodey's analysis was better overall. His PTSD was actually handled pretty well. Not amazingly, mind you, but it was a good way to end off the analysis. They don't make any jokes about it, they don't make it define his entire personality, they don't even consider it that big of a weakness. I mean, I guess they do technically put it in the same spot where they would talk about their weaknesses, but for one, it's never implied that it hinders him in combat. Combat. And for two, they immediately follow it up by saying that he's able to push past it and act like a real hero. Unlike certain parts of the fight, I guess. Okay, so I'm not the best at transitions either, but Genos doesn't sound like Genos to me. He doesn't have that cyborg-esque voice that Zack Aguilar gives him. Rhodey sounds good though, solid Don Cheadle impression overall. Though I do have to say, making a One Punch Man themed episode hand-drawn is bold. I've heard people say that they don't fit this style, I think I know why it's a thing. And it's with Genos' design. He looks good in this art style more than he doesn't, but the actual issue is that his shirt is a little too bland for my liking. It's basically the same shade of white at all times. I feel like adding a couple of gray hues here and there would fix it. In fact, I think this art style gets a little too much criticism at times. Like I've seen people say it's bad because it's not on par with Jack vs. Afro. Guys, that episode did not set a standard. It went beyond the standard. And as for another criticism I don't agree with, there's this. I don't fall apart that easy. People poke fun at this line because Genos immediately fell apart and like, um, yes? That's the point? He's trying to say that he won't get blown to pieces too easily. And what do you know? He never once gets blown to pieces too easily outside of his own terms. But as for the other criticism this show gets, I agree with the rest. The first half isn't too great. It feels kind of slow with the blatantly looped animation, which actually happens twice, twice in this episode. <laughs> Even if the second time is sort of backed up by a screen shake effect, the first one just has no effects. And the zapping scene is bad and makes no sense. Like, why does that instantly turn off Genos' everything? If that's how it works, why is it happening this early on? I don't get it. It does have a couple of highlights, like Rhodey's radar being tracked surprisingly well, it flawlessly matches its facial movements, and the digital effects make it look less fake, especially with the details of it being flipped around. And as for the second half, it definitely gets better from here. I like the need a hand exchange, and I like how they incorporated the funny Marvel vs. Capcom line. That suit was ugly anyway. Ugly! This is my Sunday best! Here's my Sunday best! And you know that I gotta give respect to the Repulsor High Five. Much like Lilac Cruise, it's beautiful and perfect. And then you have Genos using his adhesive to bypass Rhodey's invisibility, even if Rhodey always being able to break free kinda defeats the purpose, but eh, you can't make fights like these look like total stomps unless if that's the point. And then you get to the beam struggle and mm, I have been waiting for a beam struggle to be this good. It's a lot like the visuals from Charizard vs. Agumon, but in a different art style. Maybe it's not as good, but hey, 2D Fire still looks really nice. And can we just talk about this shot of Rhodey's blue lights flashing through Genos' beam? And the reverb on Genos' voice as he activates his self-destruct? Not yet! I'm taking you with me! Yo, okay, this is exciting! Sorry it had to be this way. Don't talk to me. Huh. You got it. Okay, never mind, this blows a lot of chunks. And none of those chunks are from Grandma Brownie's Chocolate Chunker Wunker Bungers, now with even bigger chunks of chocolate chunks. So, um, 50 out of 100. This is not the best episode. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, wait, I forgot to talk about the conclusion. They went Genos and he still got stumped. Okay, never mind, this is a good episode. 75 out of 100. Yes, I do wish it was better, but I still enjoyed this one. I'd say that this is a pretty solid standard for hand-drawn fights. Wait, Genos never once says incinerate? despite having several opportunities to do so? 
All right, 68 out of 100. Yeah. Normally, this is the part where I say s Death should have fought Jin Kisaragi or something, but then again, given the vitriol that Uncultured Swines have for him, as well as the matchup being almost exclusively based around a Yandere relationship, I wouldn't trust Death Battle to make a good analysis for Jin if this is the matchup they're working with. But going to the analyses that did happen... Ice Magic, here I come! Oil me up, Wiz! Okay, maybe Gray should have fought Boomstick. The jokes they make about Lost Ice Shell feel very rushed. It felt like they were setting up for a really, really funny punchline, but they went through it so fast that they forgot to add it. I don't know, that's how I'm interpreting these jokes. It's also weird how Wiz goes over his abilities and then Boomstick says, Which would have been really handy just a little bit ago! Define a little bit ago? How do these connect with one another exactly? Look, I'm not a fairy tale guy, so maybe I'm missing something here, but I think this is false equivalence. And am I the only person who likes the Boomstick dad joke in this episode? It's basically Boomstick being ecstatic that Esdeath acknowledged that she doesn't need a dad and Boomstick was relating to it. <laughs> Oh wait, I skipped ahead to Esdeath's analysis, oops. Esdeath's analysis impressed me more than I thought it would. I kind of like the cutaway and how Boomstick is so bothered by Esdeath being attracted to Tatsumi. All we're missing is a slew of baseless accusations on how the man is somehow an abuser, and this is a commentary on the least mean Twitter users. But on the other hand, it feels like the analysis kind of meanders, given how often they show the same manga scans multiple times. Like when they bring up the army feat twice. twice. And maybe the writing didn't flow together as well. They go from story to abilities, to story, to feats, and back to story. I don't know, it just feels like the flow is really weird. I'd still say I enjoyed the analysis though, definitely more than most people would. The going into why would go into personal reasons. So for now, I'll just say the phrase demonize, clarify that this was not in the context of an abuser, and pretend that you understand the context so that we can move on to the fight. Yeah, you thought other death battle tubers inside jokes were alienating? This is an inside joke not even my friend know about. It's literally just one person who doesn't talk to me anymore. Okay, I think that's a bit much, so let's talk about the fight. The voice acting is... peculiar. Gray's voice is fine. Mark Allen Jr. is great, but not as great as he was when he voiced War Machine. But Emma Breezy's Esdeath? Ugh. I mean, she's a great voice actress, actually, but I feel like she was miscast for Esdeath. I think that the criticisms have been prevalent enough to where you might understand where I'm coming from, but just in case you don't... You have no right to feel my food against your face. Is this a military general or an edgy teenager going through puberty? And the choreography sucks. These two are known as incredible strategists, yet their main strategy is to just hit harder with the same attack, or use a weaker shield to block a stronger version of that attack, which they already failed to defend against in the first place! Oh, and also, you know how some people are obsessed with complaining about some matchups being a stomp just because the winner apparently one-shots the loser? From what I understand, Esdeath is using her strongest attack almost immediately, and uh, this is why those complaints are never accurate for any match up ever. Sans Undertale has a better understanding of versus debating than the average versus debater. How in the hell is that possible? <laughs> To be fair, this fight does have some other cool moments, like the clone fight. Even if Grey apparently never starts his fights out like this, the clone fight itself is pretty neat, at least. And then you have Grey using his ice magic to forge a hammer from the debris of Esdeath's big continental attack, a rare moment of intelligence from this intelligent fighter. Especially the parts where he runs towards the sun to give us a perspective of how big the hammer is. It does cut a bit too quickly, but I like this. And the sword fight they have is actually pretty good. The poses are functional and dynamic, and the movement is snappy, aside from this last last pose from Esdeath, but what can you do? And then Esdeath does a funny laugh. <laughs> Except laugh in a way that's so cringy it loops back into being badass. <laughs> but then she gets a couple good hits on Grey, and then- She's too much! That is the weakest delivery of that genre of dialogue I've ever heard. He uses the lost ice shell, which is apparently a fairy tale meme, but here it's not funny and makes no sense. But man, Mark's delivery of it is so good! Especially with the reverb effects, and this shot goes kinda hard, not gonna lie, Gray. Lost ice shell! But nope, Esdeath ruins it with a bad line, even if her delivery of Mahoptima is decent, and then Grey resisting it being a cool moment. But then Esdeath yeets something from her arm, and I guess that ends the fight. Seriously, the only difference between Grey's death and Weiss's death is that you can see blood coming out of Grey. But at the end of the day, I'm comparing it to Weiss's death. 
That's not a good look. And of course, there's Ed Death's ugly face, which is very in tandem with the awful expression work in this episode. No joke, when I first watched this episode, I thought that the fight was unfinished at points. <laughs> Moments like this flat looking spin animation, at least Blendary had the gall to add a motion blur effect. And in general, the animations, aside from the sword fight, aren't very well polished. And of course, the death being the least finished thing of the episode. Something tells me there wasn't enough time to establish the fact that he died. And the conclusion? I've heard some controversy about the conclusion. Not to the same extent as episodes like Ryu vs. Jin, but there is some claim that they lowballed Grey and gave S-Death outside help. I'm not familiar with these series, so don't ask me if I think they're right or wrong. But to their credit, they did give S-Death other advantages as well. But that's the most I'm gonna say about this conclusion. I didn't think this episode was horrible, just kind of mediocre at best and worst. But I think the best I can give it is, uh, 46 out of 100. Congratulations. Eh, goodbye. You know what I find really amusing? If this episode was announced in any other season, people would groan and look back on it being a shit house matchup. But since this was in season 7, where it was heavily criticized for its oversaturation of Marvel and DC characters, people are happy that this matchup happened. And the matchup even kind of works better than most of their other matchups, just because they both have four arms. <laughs> that is hilarious. But then again, his positive outlook has less to do with the matchup and more to do with the episode. And going into the analyses? I don't buy it. Goro's rundown was about as boring as I expected it to be, but oy vey, they just really needed to shoehorn all those boomstick ex-wife jokes. Look, I still stand that they're worse than the boomstick dad jokes in every conceivable way, and this is precisely why, even if they weren't overused in previous episodes. The running joke is that his ex ran off with a guy with four arms. That's the entire joke. How is this funny? And since they don't say that much more about Goro, yeah, that kind of hurts this analysis quite a bit. But Machamp's rundown, on the other hand, it's actually really cool. Boomstick ex-wife joke notwithstanding. Like with Lucario's analysis, they analyze the Machamp as a species, but unlike Lucario's, they cover its evolutionary process and their Pokedex entries. They don't just talk about feats from those Pokedex entries, but they also talk about their individual personalities, like talking about how they generally like to help others and are always willing to do heavy lifting for the humans. Never thought I'd see Machamp of all things get characterized so well in the analysis, but this is one hell of a season, I tell you what. Though I I have no idea what happened with Machamp's end clip. It's so weirdly chosen and short. But I mean, come on, people like talking about the fight. I will admit, the models aren't the best. Machamp's looks great, I mean, go figure, strip straight from Pokémon Tournament. But Goro's model, it looks fine in most shots, but when it doesn't, it really doesn't. But to be fair, it is a custom model that was made during a pandemic, and they were also trying to make it match Machamp's model, so I wouldn't have given it too much flack either way. After all, it's not about how a model looks, it's about how a model is animated. Let's talk about the biggest thing that the animation has, the forearm dynamic. It's used a lot more cleverly and subtly than you would think. Like, you do have some obvious moments like the cross chop and rock smash combo, and Goro using his free arms to break out of Machamp's tackle, who then holds those arms when he tries it again. How is a Machamp of all things smarter than Ezdeath? But there are plenty of other moments that aren't as clear unless you look at them close enough. Weaker punches are used with one fist, while more impactful blows are used with two or more. Not just emphasized by an attack's power, but the sound design as well. They're especially apparent in Machamp's beatdowns. Yes, it does have the two arm punches slower and weaker, but they're supposed to be fast, and even then, his one arm punches have weaker sound design to prioritize how fast they're moving. I think that the only problem I have is Machamp building up a scream as if he's going for a super powerful attack, only to end up being a one arm punch that does nothing. And then you have the climax of the fight, where their arms are getting torn off and they're shown not reacting to it. <laughs> They grunt, they scream, they pause to look at it, and look shocked. Is that what we call not reacting to something? Okay, in all seriousness, they're often torn off fast enough to where there's not a whole lot of time to react, and also, like I said, they still scream when it happens, especially Goro. In fact, a lot of the problems I see come from this episode don't bother me so much. Not even the double dab. The dab is epic. Plus, at the end of the day, with two sets of arms, that's four times the standing hand.
Yeah. I also like the way they included Guts. From what I hear, it's super accurate to the source material, and I like how it causes him to faint after he wins. Which, by the way, the death is impeccable. Aside from this shot here, that's not too great. Machamp's equivalent of the Ora Ora is awesome, and then there's a thumbs up at the end, and even Goro's death scream is really good. And also, Four Fifth Death Punch is an amazing track with a bass reference to boot. And the conclusion is surprisingly in-depth and interesting. All that's missing is Wiz trying to unironically use Pokemon types to justify Machamp's win. 85 out of 100. It's not a supreme episode, and yes, that is entirely because of the Boomstick ex-wife jokes. How did you know? <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Out of all the episodes, this was the one I was the most excited to hear when it was announced. Entirely because of Booster Gold. No, I'm not memeing. I was a Booster Gold fan before it was cool. And that's implying that there was ever a time where being a Booster Gold fan wasn't cool. You're saying he's a D-list DC character? More like D's nuts are listed on your face? BOOM! I was able to maintain that excitement because, oh, I really like these analyses. Cables has some great lines like the mutant Jesus running joke, which I guess does come out of nowhere and isn't really justified beyond X-Man having a beard, but it being a semi-running gag in the conclusion was adequately amusing, and it works when they bring it up there. 40 f***ing zeros, bitches! Holy mutant Jesus! Not to mention that they covered Cable's backstory really well, they mentioned the alternate versions of him, and they even ended on a nice note of Cable finding a family to protect. And Booster Gold's analysis, it's my favorite of the season, not even a contest. They dissected his character arc throughout the whole thing, I love it here! Another thing I outspokenly appreciate is how they'd only bring up his mom when Booster was doing kind-hearted things. Like when he tried to win money to keep his mom alive, and when Boomstick points out how she was proud of him when he prioritized protecting the time stream over joining the Justice League. They spread it out in between his abilities and feats, with the latter being talked about when they point out his heroic actions being real and genuine. As if he wasn't already my booster goat! Oh, and as for the fight, whoa -ho -ho. Cable's voice is fine, albeit higher pitched than I would have liked. Booster Gold just outright steals the show, and he is voiced by- WHATEVER IT IS, I DON'T CARE! <laughs> Him. That's the voice of Booster Douglas. Before we get into some of the best parts of the episode, let's talk about the banter between the two. I've seen other people try to sell various matchups, you know, with a serious guy versus goofy guy by saying, Oh, the banter would be a lot like Cable versus Booster Gold, when, um, 99 times out of 100, not even half a percent close. To begin with, I'd argue that Batman vs. Iron Man is the type of banter potential you're thinking of, but the reason why Cable vs. Booster Gold's banter works so well is because of the time period that Cable represents. Remember in Ghost Rider vs. Lobo where they brought up all of these edgy comic book characters that came from Marvel and DC specifically, and how Lobo was made to parody them? Well, Cable is kind of the face of all of that. Though people like Cable are not so much the edgy character archetype. He's more the no-nonsense anti-hero who refuses to waste a single second of his time because he's more interested in focusing on his personal goals. In almost direct contrast to the more campy and, in some cases, outright goofy superheroes from previous eras. So having him fight someone like Booster Gold who, quote my friend, is a Labrador in human form, is what leads into all of this fun banter. Cable is a take no sh** kind of person who is fighting someone who never shuts up. His exchanges with Deadpool alone prove that this type of banter works specifically for Cable vs. Booster Gold. But then again, you could also say that Booster Gold came in an era of wacky superheroes, or at least one of those heroic Marvel and DC characters who had far more outlandish personalities. You can't just say that a matchup between someone who almost never talks versus a character who does nothing but talk works, and cite this episode as your one example. And just like last time, if you are a patron, then you get to figure out the example I am referring to. Not to mention the fight dynamic and, by extent, the debate, supports this banter potential even further, because the fight is basically Cable trying to get a single good hit on Booster Gold, but failing every time because that shield really is that busted. And since he's being taunted with every single one of his failed hits, it genuinely comes across like he's tired of his sh** and just wants to end the fight already. And even outside of that, you still have some really fun interactions, like this time stop punch combo gag. Like, yeah, it's a basic joke on paper, but the expressions accentuate it into a moment that's genuinely funny. And that's another one of the best things about this episode. The expression work. In a season that for the most part had really bad expressions, I'm very happy that this episode is not one of them. And all they really do is squash and stretch Booster Gold's glasses. Yet you get awesome expressions like this, and more famously, this. 
I am using this face for everything ever. And yeah, in case you couldn't tell, Booster Gold is the best thing about this episode. He steals the show whenever they let him talk, which is a lot. And he literally dabs before getting crushed by two semi-trucks. He really is not taking this seriously. <laughs> but thankfully, Cable gets to do some really cool stuff as well. He throws these F-Zero cars at him. He sets up a trap during time travel. He punches Booster Gold into a million next weeks. And he still gets some pretty cool lines here and there. He went like a girl. And like I said earlier, the force field invalidates Cable's entire arsenal. Yet they still let Cable use lots of his arsenal and even get some good combos in, creating the illusion that this was somehow not a stomp in any way. I guess Booster doesn't use as much of his arsenal, and Skeets doesn't show up whatsoever, which is a shame. And also, there's no one mistaking him for Green Lantern. Why even bother at this point? But to be fair, his arsenal's not as big as Cable's. Plus, there are all sorts of other little details, like Booster just chilling with his past selves, and the one he's vibing with tosses the criminal away. Which, believe it or not, is actually a very subtle callback to the analysis when they say that he's able to hang out with his past selves. And then you get to the part where Cable tries to control all of their minds, with Rico doing some of the best intentionally bad voice acting I've ever heard. And this leads into the reveal that Booster Gold gave his shield to Cable, whose whole body is being crushed by the shield, but not before he throws one last insult at Booster, who's clearly not having that malarkey. If I were to say any bad thing, and by any bad thing I mean literally there's just one bad thing, it's that this dinosaur looks ooh. I think my niece could do a better job than that. Back to the episode, this is another episode that people say doesn't stand out too much. The community literally made a completely new time hop meme from this episode alone. What the hell are you talking about? Personally, I think that this has clever rundowns, fun writing, stellar voice acting and banter, great use of their abilities, creative environments that are also put to great use, solid music, an amazing ending, and a conclusion that does have the whole quirky guy beat the serious guy, bet you didn't expect that sort of nonsense. But that doesn't bother me very much. This is my favorite favorite episode of the season. Call me wrong, biased, based, bold, epic, a YouTuber whose sentences keep getting cut off for no reason. You can even say this is spite, but pfft, nah, I'm too rebellious for that. I'm giving it a 95 out of 100. Yes, I'm calling it supreme. What are you gonna do about it aside from nothing? Okay, let's grab this, we got it, and then... Perfect. <laughs> You ever think about how this was the first Star Wars episode since Vader vs. Doom? Which was all the way back in, uh, you know, season 2? Yet nowadays it's basically tradition that they have a Star Wars character in every season going forward? I think it's really funny noticing that. But as for this episode, Obi-Wan's analysis was really fun. The use of Star Wars memes was pretty good, and the high ground feat was exactly what I expected, to be sure. I even liked the jizz cutaway. I've always thought it was funny, but now I think it's even funnier since Disney finally did something about this whole thing. <laughs> I also like how they tackle the different Star Wars continuities. Boba Fett vs. Samus Remastered proves that they don't care about Disney's impact on Star Wars' lore and decided that they should use feats from the likes of Legends and the EU anyway. Is this compositing? I mean, it technically is, but it's not like Obi-Wan is that different now compared to how he was back then, nor is there anything to suggest otherwise. I also like how they ended on the note of Luke being his new hope for the ways of the Jedi. Then he became a ghost! Okay, that note works too. And then it leads into Kakashi's analysis, which I say is pretty great as well. I like how they covered his story, the Boomstick dad joke, and I even like the cutaway gag. And for once, they add the touch of Boomstick waking up Wiz when it's his turn to talk, as opposed to Wiz getting knocked out and then immediately talking with no transition. Also, Wiz is a sociopath, I love it here. Although one issue I have is that they calc a mountain level feat at 18 megatons. That's not mountain level, that's city level. But whatever, let's talk about the fight. I like how it starts off with Obi-Wan trying to avoid the fight at first. I want to go home and keep reading my book after I kick your ass. No, 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 Kakashi. You literally keep that book with you until around the halfway point. That's not an insult. I think that's really funny. But I guess since I played a clip, I just want to say that I don't like Kakashi's voice. It matches the character and it's NAL. Of course, he's going to do a good job, but it feels like he has no direction. Most notably in deliveries like, I guess I have the high ground. And even I see you. I'm also going to use the same monotone delivery throughout the entire fight, pretty much. 
But in his defense, I feel like the COVID pandemic likely had some impact on this, so I won't be too harsh. Seriously, the pandemic was bad for voice actors everywhere. And to his credit, he does have at least a couple of good deliveries, most notably his Don't Give Up, wonderfully demonstrating how he's able to power through the pain and try to finish off Obi-Wan. Stephen Kelly's Obi-Wan is really good. Except for the last line. So uncivilized. So uncivilized? Is that how you're gonna say it? Ah, whatever. Steven still does a great job matching Obi-Wan's charisma. And I guess if I had to complain about anything else, Obi-Wan's model is not bad, it looks good more than it doesn't, but it's super rough in the beginning with his blank irises and choppy looking walk. The issues become easier to ignore once he takes off the robe though, but I'd be lying if I said this didn't clash with Kakashi's Jump Force model. But aside from that, yeah, I really, really like this fight. There are some fun exchanges of abilities and how the Force plays off of Kakashi's jutsus, and of course, there's the Genjutsu scene. Not only is this a really cool scene, but it also ties in a point in the analysis where the Force can allow Obi-Wan to see into the future, and of course it's followed up with a masterclass of line deliveries. Be mindful of your thoughts, Obi-Wan. They betray you. And the fight has some other standout moments like Kakashi's punches being synced to the music, Obi-Wan's aerial takedown with the Force, and the Star Wars blaster sound effect being used when Kakashi activates his Sharingan as if he's locked him down. It's actually a really clever use of sound design. And then there's the ending. It's not as good of a one-stroke duel as what we've seen before, but the build-up is still really nice, especially with Kakashi pushing through his bleeding eye and Obi using the Force to crush his organs. Oh, and shoutouts to the conclusion nuancing the Jedi's code. This is the exact type of ending that they should have had for Aang vs. Edward. While they did say that Obi follows the code to a fault, they actually go out of their way to explain what kind of power the Jedi are trying to keep down. And given how Star Wars hasn't had an episode since Season 2, which means that they haven't had a proper analysis ever, I think it was really important to bring this up anyway. Oh, and since Aang vs. Ed is being brought up, I'd like to remind everyone that Kakashi was acting as the aggressor and Obi-Wan tried to avoid the conflict multiple times through the Jedi mind trick and even a couple of warnings here and there. Plus, his last line actually laments the fact that he had to kill someone instead of shoehorning a line that tries to assassinate his character for no reason. If you're gonna have a pacifist on death battle, and if you're gonna have them win, this is how you should be nuancing it. So yeah, this episode, I do think it's kind of rough around the edges, and not gonna lie, I found Force and Lightning to be pretty generic until the ending, which even then still isn't as good as the endings of other tracks in my opinion, but I can see how this is the fan favorite of the season. 89 out of 100. I feel like if the pandemic didn't screw over this episode, this would easily be supreme. Possibly even my favorite of the season. This was a matchup that the team has been very interested in for a long time. It even got to a point where- Oh. Oh. Look, I get that he tries to act like a cool, chill dude, and I don't deny that he's trying his best, but it's still f***ing weird that he was the only creator that endorsed a Death Battle episode. Despite the fact that he wasn't actually the only one, but I get it. He's had years worth of bad controversy, so I don't blame people for feeling weirded out. That being said, I think we should really be talking about how Danny's official voice actor complimented NAL for his performance. That is very, very based. But going into the episode, okay, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, I found it really annoying at points. The rapping running gag is structured fine, it's clearly more of a self-contained meme in Danny's analysis specifically. You know, Boomstick raps, Wiz cringes, Boomstick raps again, he says he'll stop, Wiz raps, Boomstick laughs. I understand why it's here. It's like Leo versus Jason where they're trying to go for the Saturday morning cartoon vibe. But the actual problem is that it basically replaces them talking about anything interesting in his story. If you're gonna do that, be funny about it, and don't make me feel stone-faced the whole time. Oh, and you have all sorts of other clever moments, like Boomstick shaking his butt for no reason, and then getting upset when Wiz makes a pun over it as if he didn't set up Wiz at all. Look, I usually like it when Boomstick gets annoyed at Wiz trying to make a pun, but you set him up, that's your fault. Show some social awareness, Boomy. And of course, they just gotta give him feet by having him do the ghost whale. But okay, we got some cringy jokes and not much story, so what else do you have? A Nickelodeon character getting a respect thread with no fun moments, references, or fandom jokes. That is not a good look. In Jake's rundown, Boomstick sings one more time, says that he's probably gonna do it again, and then decides not to do it again. Rest in peace, running gag. You weren't all that funny, but you were almost functional. I did think that the Titanic joke was funny at first, but then Boomstick keeps going and makes two movie references in the same joke. When I saw this one revisiting it, I literally said out loud to myself, Knock it the f off! 
Look, I never watched any of these shows growing up, but it sold me on the world a little better than Danny's did, but only a little more. Instead of a fun Saturday morning cartoon vibe with these rundowns, like what they clearly wanted to go for, we got another respect thread with a mundane daytime television tone to them. That is sad. But thankfully, we kind of get that Saturday morning cartoon vibe in the fight. I like all the campy dialogue, the puns, the cheesy rapping, even if Danny forgot to add a fourth line. Okay, let me give my take on it. D to the A to the N and Y. This dragon's got claws and wings to fly. But I'm still better than this other guy, cause he dragged on so long, it made him cry. I mean, that is kind of just a rough draft, but still, I think that would have worked. Wouldn't save any of the jank animation in the museum. Like there's this shot of Jake charging right at him with a dynamic pose and slowly lifts him up with the stiff posing and bad puppet rigging. It's like the stark opposite of Miles versus Static where you can see the limbs moving and nothing else. Virtually every attack in the museum has this problem along with some obnoxious hard 90 degree angles and poses that don't even look like attacks at all. I didn't think they'd go as far as to outsource NRS animation. <laughs> And this shot of Danny in his human form is the worst. Let's just say that there's a good reason why Butchie's animation style never does this sort of thing. It creates the illusion that he's missing his eye. And then you have this shot of Jake throwing a cinder block at Danny, which looks so weird, but then Danny taunts him for it by saying, Wanna try something else? Okay, I like the delivery, but then you have Jake throwing another cinder block at Danny. Although to be fair, he does break through it and uses a weak looking slap, but Danny just lets Jake attack him for some reason. Dude, you were the one who told him to try something else. He's using the same tactic and you're really just gonna... <laughs> What, whatever, whatever. That fight still has some other cool moments, like Danny possessing this mummy, but then Jake's all like, ain't nobody got time for that, and drags him out of the museum. And then we get an aerial fight, and okay, I have to admit, this is pretty cool. Especially with all the clones and the short but gorgeous looking beam struggle, backed with that snow gradient. Ooh, that looks really nice. Jake no-selling the ghost whale is lame, especially when he later gets disintegrated by some basic laser that I'm pretty sure didn't affect him much earlier. Jake also has a couple of stiff poses in the air, but in their defense, animating flying attacks are harder than grounded attacks, so I can get over it. And then there's the tornado scene. I mean, it makes sense why it's a tornado, but it's odd how it hard cuts to all of the clones firing a concentrated fire breath, as if the tornado just randomly disappeared for some reason. But that gets saved by the impact of when it destroys the roof of a building. That is cool. But the best part of the fight is easily when Danny possesses Jake. There's this cool looking shot of Jake's eye turning into Danny's, and even though I wish he did more with the possession than just crash Jake into a couple of walls, it's not that big of a deal because that eye shot really does carry. But then we get to the ending. Am I the only one who thinks it's weird that Jake would try to outrun one of Danny's lasers knowing that he spent the entire fight dodging them or matching them with his fire breath? Of course I do like how it ends with a ghost thermos. That's a nice touch. And I gotta say, American Phantom is a pretty cool track. It fits the tone pretty well, and it feels like a nod to the Danny Phantom theme song and the musical instruments used in Jake Long's soundtrack. If this played in a club, I'd probably be bopping my head up and down. And as for the conclusion, I mean, I guess it's fine, but it's weird in how the animation contradicts a few of their points. Just a couple of points where they say Jake couldn't handle Danny's abilities only to either match or tank all of his strongest abilities, and how they say his clones could match with Jake's even though Danny's clones were clearly losing the clone fight. Man, that's quite a bit of issues, wouldn't you say? Remember when everyone thought this was a really good episode? Boy, how the mighty have fallen. People used to be all like, OMG, cartoons of my childhood, and this fight has so many cool moments. But then they started noticing the janky animations and oof, that's when the goggles came off. But speaking as someone who didn't grow up with these cartoons, yeah, I'm gonna have to give it a 34 out of 100. Jake Long vs. Juniper Lee Wen. Alright, with a brand new schedule, we have the concept of a mid-season finale. And given the matchup they went with, mid is right! <laughs> What's surprising is that this is in Torian's top 10 favorite death battle episodes. I mean, sure, it's coming from the perspective of an animator who is likely focusing exclusively on the fights. But still, I don't usually see a take like this, so I'm interested to see what he's talking about. Especially since he wasn't one of the animators working on this. And going into the analyses, well, I mean, they exist. With Adora's analysis, at least they talk about her backstory story and how the Sword of Protection broke her free from the Horde's control, and then you have Boomstick swinging the sword while Wiz is trying to talk about Shiro's abilities, and it's kind of hard to hear Wiz talking in general. And it might be just me, but I find the 80s royalty-free music to be really funny for some reason. <laughs> 
And another thing I thought was humorous was that they basically reused the exact same Yoda Yoda ton joke from Optimus Prime vs. Gundam, but they made it overwritten. Oh, but if you want to see reused content, look no further than Wonder Woman's analysis. Hey Wiz, guess what's my new number one vacation spot? Oh yeah, I know where I'm taking my next vacation. Until the day a military plane crashed near the island. Until one day when a military plane randomly crashed into paradise. We do know she was born during the age of the Roman Empire, specifically when they employed centurions. This means Wonder Woman must be about 3,000 years old. We know she was born when the Roman Empire employed centurions, so she's likely over 3,000 years old, among which are her iconic bracelets of submission. Ah. Uh. That sounds like some weird BDSM sh- Well, they kind of were. The Bracelets of Submission. The name isn't really a BDSM reference. Well, not today at least. And Kryptonian Heat Vision, which can be hotter than the sun. Heat Vision hotter than the sun? One day, Superman, who can see atoms, decided to split one to test her magic sword. Surprise, surprise, it literally blew up in their faces. <laughs> Waggy antics. Superman once used it to literally split an atomic nucleus, which promptly blew up in their faces. <laughs> Good times. According to Batman, Diana is the greatest melee fighter in the world. Fellow leaguer Batman even called her the best melee fighter in the world. Assuming Wonder Woman was pulling her fair share, this means she can lift 2.2 quintillion tons. Assuming Wonder Woman was pulling her fair share, that means she's lifting over 2 quintillion tons. Oh yeah, she punched a warhead and tanked it point blank. This chick literally punches warheads like they're beach balls. According to her fellow Justice League member The Flash, hit like a white dwarf star. That would equal 2 billion megatons of force, striking with the force of a white dwarf star. That is 2 billion megatons of force per punch. Look, I know that with Returners, it's inevitable that they're gonna be showing the same feats, same story beats, and maybe even the same numbers. That's all fine and dandy with me. But the fact that they essentially use the near exact same wording, structure, jokes, and even reactions, <laughs> stuff it tells me they really didn't want to do this. You had three years worth of new potential content to work with, and there's almost none of it. The only new additions are the de-aging serum cutaway, the ending note on how she inspired a new generation of heroes, okay, that was nice, the melee reference, okay, I take back everything I said, this rundown is peak. And before you say that Diana probably didn't have too many new stuff to talk about, the G1 prediction blog could find way more new stuff than last time. They cover a couple of new weapons, a fancy new set of golden armor, more stuff about Ares, some statements from Zatanna, etc. Even if you think that these don't add much to the episode or the debate, there's still new things to talk about. Why were they not brought up? And you think that this would be a problem with the fight, but I don't think so. But the second biggest problem with the fight is that it can't decide on a tone. The music is going for a more epic dramatic tone, but then you have Adora and Diana having dialogue that almost feels like it's trying to parody dumb 80s dialogue, but they never once listen to Kylo Ren's advice. I do like when dramatic fight scenes get balanced out by fun campy dialogue, but only when it's done well, and this was not it. The dialogue in question feels like it's trying to sound serious, and there are no signifiers like the music dropping out or any funny facial expressions to convey that it's supposed to be humorous. But then again, that's under the admittedly flawed assumption that these lines are supposed to be in any way hysterical. But to be fair, the fighting stuff is mostly fine, with the only issue being that the pillar is thrown very slowly, and the super breath scene forgets to add a shot of Diana actually getting hit by it. Oops. But the fight in the forest is a very solid improvement. The Sword of Protection becomes a Beyblade, and it even led to a cool slow-mo shot of Diana dodging it. And there's also some magic redirection here and there, the invisible jet gets destroyed, and then there's this amazing 14 second long shot of clean sword fighting. Nothing but gorgeous attack trails, dynamic camera tracking, and even a moment where Adora briefly chucks her sword in the air just to throw some hands. Honestly, I'd say that this feels like a full-on Torian fight. Major props to the animators. Although this one backflip looks a tad unclear, but that's the only issue. But then you have this moment with Adora wailing away at Diana's bracelets, which breaks them. And I've heard that this is immersion shattering, but I don't agree with that at all. Adora never once attacked Diana's bracelets beforehand, and she was very obviously wearing down their defenses. Plus, it's a decent way of demonstrating how Adora is physically stronger than Diana. And unlike with Wendy's previous episode, we finally get a setup for a badass fight scene in Diana's god mode. There's the shot of her letting it take control, and then this even better shot of her eyes being revealed with a sword flip, and then she pins a door by a tree and... It's over. But these trees are actually very interesting for me to talk about.
It gets criticized for the rundowns going over many cosmic level feats, yet the fight ends with Diana cutting down some trees. But I remember Hulk vs. Doomsday did the exact same thing, and everyone said that episode was cool. I guess the criticism doesn't apply if you want to like the episode. That being said, I do agree that these trees are a problem. It's just that the problem lies somewhere else, and never since Ragna vs. Soul would I ever have the opportunity to use the term weak and creep ever again. But going off of the fight, the best strength feat it's close to the beginning when Diana yanks down a stone pillar and Adora casually catches it with one hand. From what I've seen of people more familiar with the He-Man show, the cosmic level feats aren't that prevalent. I mean, they probably are for DC, but not for Masters of the Universe. So I think it's fine to have a more grounded fight with the occasional feat of strength that is noticeably lower than anything they've gotten in the analysis. Hell, He-Man's episode had exactly that. But with this fight, the best strength feat demonstrated from either character is very close to the beginning. But by the end of the fight, Diana goes into her god mode, and it ends with Diana cutting down some trees. Also, I'm pretty sure that this feat is less raw strength and more her sword is able to slice through atoms. Not to mention that we see Diana, in her base form, cutting the invisible jet in half which I'm pretty sure would require more force than a few trees. Even the Beyblade of Protection is able to knock over a tree by flicking it a little bit. And Diana's even able to kick a tree at a door like she's deflecting a bullet! Oh, and a side note, you can't hide your unlocking elbows from me, Diana, nor can you hide your unbending knees. So yeah, in a weird way, we have another Death Battle episode that uses a form of weaken creep. It's one thing to criticize an episode for a poor use of power creep, but that's always gonna be better than a weaken creep, because at least the former has any reasonable sense of scale. Like, if you're gonna cut down a few trees, cut down the entire forest while you're at it. Oh, and uh, Adora's hair is sticking to her head fully intact, as if she's some sort of Polly Pocket or something. I mean, to be fair, I can't admire the custom models that both characters have, but moments like these look really off. Like with Diana's match against Thor, I could see a great episode here, but sadly, She-Ra vs. Wonder Woman feels like an episode that's trying too hard to be cool but can't decide on a tone and can't make these combatants look as powerful as the analysis says they are. But I will admit, that 14 second long shot and most of the climax before the death really is good, enough to where I can't reasonably call it a bad episode though I gotta give it a 51 out of 100. But then again, this episode still has its casual enjoyers, so it clearly got something right. Can I just say that the waiting period for this was one of the best waiting periods of the entire show? And a good chunk of that is almost entirely because of Beerus. He was one of the first few characters teased despite not being in the first half, and then at the end of She-Ra vs. Wonder Woman, they just casually dropped that Beerus is gonna be among the mid-season premiere. There was a lot of speculation as to who he was gonna fight. It could've been someone obvious, someone we didn't know, someone good, someone bad. Everyone's guess was about as good as each other's. Not very. Not to mention that Death Rays was a fun little distraction, and DBX? So anyways, Beerus was eventually revealed to fight Sailor Galaxia, and, well, it's about time they got Sailor Moon on the show. And given that this episode doesn't exist, I think that could contribute to why we haven't seen another Sailor Moon episode since. But thankfully, they do still have interest in at least one more Sailor Moon episode, albeit almost exclusively featuring Usagi, but I digress. Oh, and in case you're wondering why Toei explicitly went after this episode instead of literally every other Dragon Ball episode, well, from what I've been told, Toei only has partial rights to Dragon Ball, whereas they have full rights to Sailor Moon, and this episode features both, so yeah. At least that's my understanding anyway. But anyways, on to the episode. I would like to point out that this episode introduces Dummy. I like him. I feel like that the show is still trying to learn how to utilize him, but I think that for his first outing, it was pretty good. Obviously, he's a guinea pig for Wiz, so naturally he has crippling depression, especially since Wiz supposedly has an infinite number of him in production. And I think his pessimism bounces off of Boomstick's eccentricities and Wiz's passion for science, even if they don't always utilize it to the fullest. But I say that in season seven specifically, it's arguably the best they've utilized him, at least in my opinion. I have no clue what other people think though. Beerus's rundown was interesting. Hearing some fun facts about cats and their personalities were weirdly fitting. Not just because Beerus is based on a cat, but also because that's his personality. And since Beerus is one of the only Dragon Ball characters I genuinely like, this made me appreciate him even more. But of course, this had to be the start of the Dragon Ball universe size explanation and the universe shockwaves, so now we can feel what's coming. In their defense, this was their first time covering it, and it was neat. 
It just doesn't need to be the normal feat for every Dragon Ball character going forward. Why do you think people wanted Bardock so badly? As for Galaxia's analysis, I'd honestly say it was pretty amazing. They spend a full minute shaping the world of Sailor Moon and how their powers work, but then there's a sudden shift in music once they start talking about Galaxia, in which they cover her backstory, motivations, abilities, and the differences in the stories before going into versus stats. In terms of balancing versus stats and story, this is arguably the best utilization of it, especially with the ending note on how the concept of love, which was in the form of Usagi, was what led to her ultimate demise. The way it was built up and the royalty-free music they used during these moments is top-tier production. I think the only problem I have is that they don't elaborate on how bad Galaxia's life was on her home planet, but I reckon that's because of time constraints. Although people are still shocked that Wiz is into inflation. What I'm more concerned is why Boomstick is happy for him. Is there something that he's not telling us either? Let's not worry about that, because we gotta talk about the fight, and this is exactly what I wanted from Thanos vs. Darkseid. That fight tried to go for a cosmic level where planets, stars, solar systems, etc. were being destroyed as a byproduct of their fight, but ultimately failed in the power creep, pacing, and sound design. But this fight succeeds in all of those areas. And also unlike Thanos vs. Darkseid, where it starts with street tearing and rushes into solar system destruction, with Beerus vs. Galaxia, BAM! A planet being destroyed is the first thing that happens in the fight. Well, the second thing. The first is Beerus enjoying some sea salt ice cream, which is apparently the name of the track. By the way, have any of you guys actually tried putting salt on your ice cream? Like, it's actually pretty good. Really bad for your health, you'll get a heart attack, but as someone who's tried it multiple times, it's pretty good. In regards to the power creep, it doesn't get too much higher than that, but their first serious attack destroys an entire field of asteroids. Small ones for sure, but it's still a lot. And then later on they destroy Sun and get so into their fight that they create a black hole. And this also supports the really well done pacing. At first they're not trying to fight each other, just trying to point each other to death. See this amusing little pointing fight. But then they start taking things seriously, using abilities that, while powerful, don't exactly try to one-shot each other. And then later on there's the Hello Stranger, Welcome scene that simmers things down and lets the fight breathe for a bit. And it gets to show the differences in personalities, with Galaxia conquering the planet before destroying it, and Beerus just destroying it outright before the alien could finish its sentence. Also, I find it kind of funny how these aliens are literally just sprites from Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door. And then by the ending, when that black hole is created, Galaxia gets so fed up that she just outright tries to push Beerus into the black hole, who starts using his Ultra Instinct to escape it. And overall, the sound design is really good, especially with the exploding sun where it's synced with the music, which I will admit is better than I remember. It has the choirs and the guitar solos, basically everything you'd want in a final boss theme. And it does help accentuate the fight in the sun, which, while the posing is really limp, the visuals still look really nice. And finally, there's the voice acting. Galaxia has some generic non sequiturs as dialogue, which is a shame, especially since this is Sailor Moon's first episode. Like, you're telling me you couldn't characterize her better than that? Ah, oh, well, I do think the delivery is really good. And as for Beerus, so oh, you have chosen death. Oh. What do you think? Seriously, Beerus saying so you have chosen death in the most nonchalant way possible is something that I never knew I needed. And the rest of his lines are really solid as well. He nails the comedic line solid enough and his other lines are even better, with one example that people really, really like. What? That's impossible! Now you're catching on! I am the impossible! I think it's just okay. This whole, that's impossible, no I am the impossible, is actually kind of something that other death battles have tried to do before. I think his real final line is my favorite though, in spite of this supposedly traced image from what I'm hearing. But this line shows that Beerus has no ill will towards causing so much cosmic level destruction over some f***ing ice cream. And as for the conclusion, okay I was kind of disappointed. I like how they say both characters are most likely way stronger than they initially determined, and went into elaborate detail for Galaxia specifically, but when it came to Beerus, they just said, oh, we said that he lied about using 100% of his full power, and took that one quote at face value, and never once tried to determine how much stronger he could get. And the stuff about their various powers, abilities, and hacks, which I'd argue is more important given how close they say it is, were reserved for black boxes, instead of being directly name dropped. But that's kind of all my gripes with it. 82 out of 100, it's a solid episode. All that was missing was Jocelyn saying that Usagi is dumber than a Magikarp. Ooh, an Avatar episode that's based around a matchup that's actually good? What could possibly go wrong? Oh wait, people hate this one. Aside from one exception, this is usually considered to be the low point of the season, which is saying a lot given how many low points are in this half of the season specifically. And I think I know exactly where they come from, because Zuko's analysis 
Well, I have words for it. Like, there are quite a few Boomstick dad jokes. Like, there's one in the prelude, which is a fun little jab at Boomstick. Okay. And there's another functional joke that feels natural. Alrighty. And then there's two more. Oh, okay, those were definitely forced. And then the next one, wait, that was a Boomstick jab. You had five of them in here? Okay, while I still stand that the Boomstick ex-wife jokes are worse, I can totally understand why people hate the Boomstick dad jokes more. Two of them were fine, but the other three didn't need to be there. Especially since Shoujo's had only one. If you needed them to support the core theme of the matchup, okay, fair enough. But don't you think that five in Zuko's analysis and one in Shoujo's analysis is a bit unbalanced? But I gotta admit, I I honestly found the shoehorned avatar memes more annoying despite there only being like two of them because it sounds like they're trying way too hard to include them. Yeah, I know I criticized Danny versus Jake for not having any fandom memes, but here I feel like the implementations were actually shoehorned. I'm sure you could weave them in more naturally, but dropping one of them the moment you reference a location is really not good comedy. And yet somehow none of these are considered to be the worst part of the analysis for people. And now that he's the fire daddy, uh, Lord, are you crushing on Zuko. What? No. No. <laughs> yeah, you are. All right. Let's talk about this. So the Death Battle cast directly confirmed that the whole thing was a reference to the writer's childhood crush on Zuko. Originally, it was just gonna have one subtle nod, but then Ben Singer thought it was funny because he viewed it as more of a reference to how the Atla fandom is always crushing on Zuko and shipping him with everyone. Okay, let's be real here. Everybody has a crush on Zuko to some degree. It felt wrong to me to have a script that didn't address that in any way. When she was writing that, I was like, yeah. Shit, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> and I could definitely see this, especially since this is somehow not the only sus joke that I've heard related to Zuko specifically. If you went on a life-changing uh, adventure with Zuko, <laughs> what would that be? Yeah. Yeah. I would get pregnant. <laughs> hey, Grey Delisle, you are being oh so f being weird, please stop. And this has also caused a rumor that this was confirmation that Wiz was pansexual. <laughs> okay, look, look. I'll admit this was a rumor I believed for a while, but after doing several weeks of trying to find anything confirming this, I could not find anything confirming Wiz as pansexual. The only thing I could find was a line on the Death Battle Wiki, which has no citation for some reason. Let me just say that I have no beef with the people who work on the Death Battle Wiki, and I'm only calling them out here because I know that at least a few people who are active on there watch my videos and they're quick to make changes, so um, either cite a source or get rid of this line. Oh, and also cite the Death Battle cast episode where Ben says, Who said Wiz had a wife? Or whatever the quote is. Because I couldn't find that one either. Don't get me wrong, the execution is terrible. No way around it. But the intent was meant to be something else. Now let's move on to Shoto's analysis before things get out of hand. I will admit that Shoto's rundown was better. His family history was interesting to learn about, and I like how they ended things off with how Shoto patches things up with his mother and inspires his father. Fire. Like my father. I'll prove I'm better than both of you! Uh... The boomstick dad joke does hinder the ending note, but the royalty-free music is competently used, so it balances out in a way. But something that I've noticed with both of these analyses is that they oddly feel very Season 1-esque. I do appreciate the focus on story, but the fact that there's practically no numbers, at least not for Shoto, is really bizarre. And if you looked in the script, you'll find a steaming hot pile of foreshadowing. Several, actually. But let's get into the fight, and yeah, I can definitely feel the disappointment despite not being a fan of Atla or My Hero Aka. I think the voice acting is pretty good. I mean, Zuko's voiced by his official voice actor, Dante Bosco, and Shoto's voice, eh, it works. Based on what I could get from the ending clip, it sounds pretty accurate. But after that intro, which I already kind of made fun of, the first half has some problems. He's just like me. I like this line on paper, but I don't like how it basically goes nowhere. It's not brought back in the fight or anywhere else in the episode, nor do they try to de-escalate the situation or turn it into something else. If anything, I feel like this line would work way better at the end of the fight, where you could also mess around with the kill where it's more of an emotional ending. Maybe that might be a bit too much to ask, but who knows. I mean, I like Zuko's melting under pressure line, but aside from that, there's a lot of really awkward looking sprite animation and puppet rigging, but then the ice wall happens. 
it looks kind of bad. But then the merchant cabbages get destroyed. The music begins to quiet down. Zuko breaks out of the ice wall to shoot more fire at Shoto, and then he blocks it with ice. And then the following scene has Shoto breathing heavily with the amount of ice he's outputting, with the music quieting down even further. And then there's this unfortunate fathomable hand-drawn shot of Shoto's eye, where you can practically see the eye muscles tensing up before it opens. Along with Shoto's incredibly delivered Go Beyond line, this moment gives me chills every single time. Pun intended, but also not really. And then the music starts to go INCREDIBLY HARD! Obviously taking a page out of My Hero Aka's soundtrack, but after this scene, the second half is SPECTACULAR! Way better than I remember, and way better than what other people have been saying. Except for this shot of Shoto. But the fire and ice visuals look way better too, especially with this shot of the ice and fire trails combining. Ooh. I mean, yeah, Shoto's pose looks really weak, but LOOK AT ALL OF THIS! It overshadows the pose immensely, especially since at some point you can just not see it anymore! <laughs> And then Shoto's final attack shatters not just Zuko, but also his own ice wall. And then Shoto becomes a 3D model in a sprite fight. <sighs> Apologies. That is not how you say that's rough, buddy. But then we get to the conclusion, and neither character received any quantifiable feats beyond some vague building level stuff. On top of their speeds basically being equalized, and the ice wall is able to cover half of a four kilometer stadium. Yeah, this is what we're working with. This is how Shoto gets the W. But to their credit, they do also say that Shoto's ice is powerful enough to disrupt firebending, and Zuko doesn't exactly do well against powerful ice. It is kind of tough for me to say if this conclusion is good or bad, but either way, it's very season one. Zuko's rundown was poorly written, and the first half of the fight is pretty bad, but damn, that second half almost overshadows every single negative. And also, Shoto's analysis was alright. But man, I can definitely understand why this is the low point of the season for other people. 49 out of 100. Maybe it's because I don't have any attachment to the matchup characters or series, but at least I still found some stuff worth praising. Alright, now we're at an episode where I'm in an interesting position, because as of right now, Wally West is my favorite character that Death Battle has ever used. Specifically the DCAU version, and yes, I know it's technically not my Wally, as Death Battle is using the comic book version of him, who I also like in spite of not having read that many comics. But the fight uses his DCAU design, and the first half of the fight is definitely referencing the Flash Museum episode where Flash is trapped in the mirror dimension. Even though I think it's more so the cosmic highway or something, I genuinely can't remember what it's called. Thank you. But either way, this episode kickstarts the possibility of using specific versions of other characters. Not using a fully composited Sonic or Barry Allen who magically scales to all of the Flashes, but straight up one Flash versus one Sonic. We don't need too many of these, but I like how they're always being considered regardless. Fingers crossed for DCEU Shazam vs Movie Sonic, by the way. But in terms of Wally's analysis, his rundown doesn't focus too long on comic book Wally and ironically shows more of DCAU in terms of describing his personality, even making some fun references to Justice League Unlimited. Appreciated, but given that this is supposed to be comic book Wally, it does come across a little odd. However, much like with Strange and Fates, I'm not looking for story or jokes. I want to hear all about his crazy powers and feats. And aside from the music essentially being the same throughout and the unnecessary narb joke, they did an okay job here. Not good, not bad, just okay. Archie Sonic also does this, and in some ways better than in Wally's, but it also feels like they're saying, here's a story, but look at all of these feats! I mean, they show some story differences, but the focus is all on his powers and feats. You're correct, Boomstick. That is not how you say the line. Though I will admit, I did chuckle when Wiz said that his internal processor came from a fridge. Oh, and another thing I found funny? Sonic's end clip is the exact same as his end clip from Season 1. But before we get into the fight, I'd like to say that this is the first episode where they actually discuss what immeasurable speed means. For Wally, it's where he runs so fast that there is no quantifiable amount of time that can calculate it. And for Sonic, it's mainly in the fact that Sonic could still move while time was frozen, this black box that confirms Sonic could do so through speed alone, and this statement that outright states Sonic can move at incalculable speeds. I say this is a good way of explaining it for a casual audience, even if there is some major issues that casuals would find very confusing, but we'll get into that later. Let's talk about the fight first, and both halves have kind of the opposite pros and cons. The first half has fun banter and good voice acting, but there's almost no use of their more interesting powers, mainly just blitzing and punching each other really fast. I know it's the first half, but given how much there is, I would have expected to at least have Wally using some 
lightning and tornado powers. Hell, Supersonic's barely even on screen for 30 seconds. But as for the second half, it does get better with Wally dragging Sonic through the Speed Force, Sonic using his elemental abilities, Wally using his phasing, Sonic using some chaos control, and Wally... Okay, we'll get back to you later. But the banter weirdly stops. I do think it has some fun moments to compensate, like Sonic getting impatient with Wally rolling around the planet for like four seconds, but I wouldn't expect these two to stop talking. I think there should have been a line of Sonic saying something like, um, waiting, in like the most annoying yet Sonic way possible. The one time you have either one of them talking is, um, nice try, and I'm invincible when I'm like this. You've mastered speed, but I've mastered fate, and I wish you gone forever! straight from Ken Penders' writing style. So yeah, this is worse than all of Esdeath's line and deliveries combined, and that's disappointing. I am aware that in the comics, Sonic does have a tendency to be a glazer sometimes, but just outright admitting that anyone has mastered speed or is in any way comparable to his own speed is just very wrong. And even if you remove the context, the line itself is just ridiculously overwritten. It doesn't even sound like he's saying it in a confident voice. So, as you can see, both halves definitely have have wasted potential in different areas. Now, I'm not saying that the fight needed to be longer, as there's no guarantee that it would have made for a better fight, but the main issue comes from the choreography and how simplified it is. I don't think I even need to entertain the idea of how many powers were left out of the episode, but even if we worked with what we got, it doesn't feel like they're always using their powers very creatively. I mean, I like seeing Wally dragging Sonic across time and all, and again, Sonic does have some creative uses of his elemental powers, but everything else just kind of feels like it's the bare minimum. A very solid bare minimum, but still a bare minimum. Plus, the episode does have other factors to consider. Now, let's talk about some core aspects of the animation. Is the sense of speed conveyed better than Barry versus Quicksilver? Technically, yes, as not only does it look like they move fast for once, but they attack even faster, too. Unlike in Barry versus Quicksilver, where they're demonstrating the same speed throughout and their attacks feel kind of slow at times. Even if we don't have a sense of scale for this environment, when they're moving along, I'd say they're moving really fast. But there is the biggest issue with this entire episode, and personally, I think it is so problematic that it directly hinders the episode itself. Not just the fight, but the conclusion and even the analyses. And just like with Ben 10 vs. Green Lantern, I'm going to go into outside factors here, but also like with that episode, it has little to do with me defending the episode's verdict and everything to do with me explaining how I would improve the conclusion, and to an extent the analysis. Let's break this down. Going by the description of the Death Battle Wiki, as well as the Death Battle cast, Wally is calling out to his family to remain in reality as he taps into the Speed Force again. And when his hair catches fire, that's not him becoming Ghost Rider, though I will admit that is a very funny description. But this is supposed to be the Speed Force illuminating his hair with intense kinetic energy. And then Wally uses the Speed Force to move forward in time to where Ultrasonic's form wears off. Then he uses the Infinite Mass Punch to force Sonic to relive every second of his life and the time he has left until until he disintegrates. I actually really like this idea. Not only is it creative, but it also works as a very subtle callback to this part from Sonic's analysis. You know you're a badass when the most powerful chaos wizard out there decides the only way to beat you is to just wait until you die of old age. But here's the problem. The analysis and even the conclusion never once explain how Wally can do all of this. So to a casual audience, they have no idea of what's going on. And this is another way of tapping into the whole wasted potential discussion. It's less that the episode doesn't make use of their powers, and more that the analysis doesn't cover the full extent of them. They did this for Sonic fine enough, but not for Wally. -E. All they say about the infinite mass punch is that it can knock you across the planet when it's way, way more complex than that. In fact, you might be surprised to hear that the infinite mass punch is almost never actually infinite. But does this mean Wally -E can actually do this in canon? Yeah! Like, I'm sure you could find a comic scan of him doing exactly this, but he has done something very similar to this in the DCAU against a Flash copy that Lex Luthor made when he was fused with Brainiac. But even if he's unable to do this in the comics, I think that Wally using a combination of the kinetic energy, the speed force, and the infinite mass punch would be way too much for Sonic to handle. Especially if this interpretation is supposed to be what's happening to him. But still, Death Battle never explains he could do this, nor do they bring up this clip or any scans of him doing this. And once 
once again, this is why I consider the rundowns to be way more important than most people do. When Death Battle covers a feat or ability to a degree that feels important, they try to include that in the fight in the way that they describe it, and it rewards the viewer for watching the analysis and getting it memorized. Of course, you do have moments where there's a disconnect, like with Black Panther's adamantium suit being able to rob projectiles of their momentum, only for Batman's batarangs to bounce off of them, and that's a failure on the animation's part. But Flash vs. Sonic displays the other kind of failure, where the analysis doesn't explain that Wally can do anything like he does in the ending. I think the only other time something like this has happened was in Thanos vs. Darkseid, where Thanos turns Deadpool into confetti, but the casual viewer could see this as Thanos snapping him away. But they can never do something like this with Wally's head catching fire and making Sonic relive his entire life. And they don't explain any of this in the conclusion either. They go over some things he had, but the first two-thirds of the conclusion focus on describing how the black hole thing, a prominent reason why Ben wanted to stop using Archie composites for Sonic characters, likely isn't the feat they think it is. But then they just give him the calc anyway, so what was the point of describing any of this in the first place? Also, they really tried to prove that a black hole detonation is weaker than a white dwarf star- what? Then they say that speed was a non-factor, only to dedicate way too much time to prove how Wally would always be faster. You know why I still like Strange vs. Fate's conclusion? It's because they do not waste time. No anti-feats, no arbitrary numbers that mean nothing in the end, and no shenanigans. And they also gave a little thematic victory as a nice little ending note just to wrap it all in a nice little bow. They don't do that here. I mean, sure, they eventually come around to discussing how their powers play off of each other, and how Wally has dealt with the same things that Archie's Sonic's stronger forms are able to dish out, and this is the one good part of the conclusion. So yeah, I guess bringing back the Robinson potential test for the one other time in this series, I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't pass. While they technically use quite a bit of their powers, there isn't nearly enough of them, and it doesn't fit with the core theme of speedsters with ridiculous arsenals and feats, nor does it line up with any of the conclusion's arguments. Despite this, I can't bring bring myself to say that the episode is bad. It's good! The fight may not have lived up to its potential, but it's fun, and at the end of the day, Wally West is my favorite character Death Battle has used so far, and since I got to see more DCAU Wally than I was expecting, that makes me happy. So I'm just gonna give this episode a 65 out of 100. Would have liked to have seen more, but hey, at least we didn't get Sonic vs. Goku. <laughs>second live action episode. In Nightwing vs. Daredevil, while I didn't say the episode was good, I feel like I was very lenient on it compared to most other people, and I outright found some of the common criticisms really dumb. But I can't deny, it needed a lot of improvement. Something like more use of their abilities, and maybe a longer fight time as well. Let's see how this episode did it. Bucky's analysis was actually really good. They focus on his relationship with Cap, mention how they've had to fight each other multiple times, and end it with how he's redeemed himself to a point where he even got the chance to carry the shield. Yeah, I might not care for the jokes, but I kinda like seeing Wiz jealous over Bucky's mechanical arm. And as for Red Hood's analysis, it was more engaging in every way. It has a surprisingly not immediately terrible callback to Boomstick's joke about sidekicks from the prelude. Hey, I think we all know which one of us is the real sidekick here. When you think of the word sidekick, who immediately comes to mind? You. It's you. Which, by the way, they show Mario Power Tennis, this is peak. And then they talk about that time where the fans got to choose whether or not Jason should die, and then have Boomstick say that the fans' choices don't matter. <laughs> how topical. His story was also covered really well on how he became an enemy of Bruce, especially when they go over his thoughts on Bruce's refusal to kill others. It adds an interesting contrast to why Bucky was always fighting Steve. One was brainwashed, while the other chose to be an enemy. Jason donned a new identity inspired by his own killer. You mean the Joker? Though I will say, like with Zuko vs. Shoto, there's a surprising lack of versus content in their analyses. But whatever, let's get to the fight. And yep, this is better than Night Devil in every way. Wouldn't say it outright replaces its existence, but let's not lie, this episode's a banger. The environment alone has all sorts of easter eggs that I wish I could tackle upon. Just go to the Death Battle Wiki, they probably have a full section of these. Besides, it's just a small part of why I really like the setup. It establishes that Bucky is out there somewhere while giving time to focus on what Jason's doing. And the banter between Bruce and Jason is not only fun, but also matches with what they said in the analysis, with Jason being a conflicted hero. Seeing him just outright not give a shit about Batman's concerns, but still demonstrates that he wants to help solve the case. Plus there are some quality of life changes, such as better sound design and a larger variety of things happening. Like these tense shots of Bucky pushing back Jason's pistol as hard as he can, and the multiple instances where Jason tries to tear off Bucky's arm. Which, by the way, was made entirely with CGI and a metallic sleeve. 
For a season that supposedly had less time to do this, wow. I mean, on revisit, I did notice some CGI during the part when Bucky takes off his sleeve, even if the shot itself is really cool. But otherwise, it's blended in really, really well. And even the music, while not something I'd listen to on its own, because it's more of a movie score type of thing, it adds some really nice suspense to crucial scenes, particularly when Jason is sneaking around and highlighting changes in scenery and shots. You know, like the crowbar scene. Oh, this is haunting. The teal lighting already made the atmosphere feel chilly, but when they have the voices distorted with bit crunches, the lights flickering in random places of the background, that ringing noise, and Jason's heavy breathing overpowering pretty much every other source of sound. Although it did ruffle some feathers in terms of how it represents PTSD, and I don't have PTSD, so I'm not gonna comment on how accurate it is. However, like with the Crash Bandicoot autism thing, I think that we should normalize hyping up the opinions of people who do suffer from PTSD than the ones who don't. So, if you have PTSD, or if you actively study it for a living, or at least for an education, I'm all ears. Give me your thoughts if you feel comfortable. But until then, let's move on. I also like how Jason says sorry Bruce just before injecting the venom. It works really well as a last resort because Jason has literally nothing left, and it demonstrates that he still cares about Bruce. I mean, I guess the venom transformation is a bit underwhelming given that it barely looks different from his normal build, but at the same time, his deeper voice and his muscles tearing do make for a neat little transformation. Hell, even the cracks in his helmet look so good. You know, much like the rest of the battle damage, which Nightwing vs. Daredevil also didn't have too much of, even after one of the combatants died. Though, um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, I think Nightwing vs. Daredevil still has a better death overall. It may have been a punch, but at least it was a charged punch. This is just a head pat. This shot of Bucky's arm coming through the smoke, cool. But everything else, not only did these punches here have way more impact, but you can still see the lights from Jason's helmet glowing in the next shot. I don't even think he died! And while the score was perfection beforehand, the ending uses the exact same rhythm at the part when Jason is using his stealth to get a sneak attack, which made me think that Jason was gonna get back up in this next shot. And if that was the intent, then maybe they should have had Jason trying to lift himself up as a way of demonstrating how he's clinging on to the remaining life he has left. Or, you know, you could have just changed the instruments to something calmer. That works too. And then we move on to the conclusion and... Ugh, this is so, so dreadful. They say that Bucky has more experience and skill. Okay, but that doesn't automatically mean he's stronger. The rundown say that Jason can dodge bullets and punch through a submarine hall, and they say that Bucky... That's the end of the sentence. I mean, yes, they say that he can keep up with characters like Iron Man and crush a cosmic cube in his hand, but for the latter, there's nothing quantifiable, and for the former, that's because of the power of his lasers, which Bucky very obviously does not have. And given how they literally say that Jason breaking Supergirl's grip shouldn't be taken at face value, they needed to give us more arguments for Bucky winning. I know what they are, but I didn't at the time, so I was very confused as to how Bucky won. Although they do say that Bucky's arm can shatter knives while knives can crack Jason's cowl, it doesn't change the fact that it can still block knives, and even then, they don't say if Bucky's arm can break Jason's cowl at all, let alone kill him like this. Dude, you have no idea how close we were to another Supreme episode of this season. From a versus standpoint, this is awful. It's unironically worse than some conclusions from season one. Because at least some of those were correct by their own logic. When you ignore all of that, this episode is stupendous. With many others saying that it's in the top three best episodes of this season. And while I don't agree with that, that's because I think it's in the top two. 90 out of 100. But this does not invalidate the existence of Night Devil. STOP oh, SAYING THAT! <laughs> no, 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 stop, stop, stop the music. I just want to get this out of the way. I've just run out of sugar, again, so let me just say that Venom vs. Krona is the dumbest matchup idea of the entire season. And yes, I know exactly what's coming soon, and I still stand by that. Like, a lot of people say that Krona had way more interesting opponents that Death Battle could have gone with. Yeah, 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 I agree with all that, but that's kind of obvious. Here's something that I don't think anyone else had brought up. Venom had more interesting opponents that Death Battle could have gone with. Like their Spawn, Jackie Estacado, Zato 1. Hell, the guy he previously fought was far more interesting thematically than Krona ever will be. What do these two even have in common? Two and one? 
I guess it's there, but Jack Gies Dicados is at least about how the second alien half is from an alien race, whereas if I remember correctly with Ragnarok, it comes from something completely different. Not to mention Zato 1 already ratios that even harder because his other half stems from an obsession much like the symbiote. What else is there? They uh, attack with a black liquid? All of Venom's other opponents do that too. Not sure what makes Cronus so special. The relationship between Peter and Maka respectively? Even with my limited knowledge of Soul Eater, I can tell you firsthand that the relationship between Peter and Eddie is way, way, way more complicated than with Krona and Maka. Or at least their stories are noticeably different. They both eventually overcame their creator. <clears throat> That requires compositing multiple versions of Venom, at least in a sort of Game Sonic and Archie Sonic kind of way. What else is there left? Uh, there's also, um, one character attacks with sound and the other person is weak to sound. And yeah, at that point you should have scrapped the entire episode and denied this matchup's existence entirely. Okay, okay, I know that the debate was more complex than that. At the same time, I directly talked with people who worked on the G1 blog for Venom vs. Krona, and they said that the only reason they had Krona win would be if they didn't use Case's Venom. Which which a lot of people say Venom should have won because they did talk about it, but in Death Battle's defense, they never once implied that it was a different version, which I think they should have, or at least said that King and Black was non-standard or something, at the risk of pissing people off even more. So with all that in mind, if we were ranking each episode based on how good the matchup was, I would genuinely put Venom vs. Krona in the bottom 10. But then again, the connections wouldn't be enough for me to do that. Like, it could be a whole thing with Gus vs. Nightmare. Yeah, the matchup may be limp, as it's just they have big swords, and they have slain armies by themselves, but at the same time, I can't deny that a Berserk X Soul Calibur crossover goes kinda hard. And I guess a Marvel X Soul Eater crossover could also work, but Marvel has all sorts of popular characters directly based on horror tropes and creatures, and I don't see why Venom has to be that character. But then again, it could also be like Android 18 vs Captain Marvel, where there are no connections, but you look at them side by side and say, okay, I think aesthetically this does kinda vibe. Do I even need to say anything? Well, I guess there is one reason why you'd want to use Venom, but that's a whole nother story I'll get to in a bit, but let's talk about these analyses and how I like them more than Venom's other episode. I mean, yeah, with mostly the same as his older one, while they didn't attempt any of the jokes, but as far as story goes, they actually do a really good job, with the only real issue that they forgot to give Venom any strength feats or speed feats, just saying that he's vaguely really fast and vaguely really strong. Even his previous episode scaled him to a juggernaut feat and heavily went over the Ferris wheel thing, and said how he could catch up to bullets, but still. I do like how they cover the Eddie Brock side of the character more in depth and end his rundown with how he patched things up with Peter. Spoiler alert, I don't have a lot of nice things to say about this episode, Episode, but Venom's analysis has very little to do with my criticisms. But as for Krona's rundown, Krona's rundown was eh. I guess Soul Eater was fleshed out fine, and I do like how they went over Krona's tragic past, for what little there is throughout. They don't focus on their relationship with Maka as a parallel to Eddie and Peter, nor do they cover Ragnarok that extensively, especially in comparison to how they do with the symbiote and Eddie, and gee, it makes you think that it's almost like this fight was a complete mismatch from the moment it came into existence. But now we have to start with the fight, and I can't really bring up my criticisms with the episode without going into long-winded tangents I have, but think about it this way. It's a video essay inside of a video essay. That must be four times the video content. So yeah, I'm gonna finally start making proper use of my three majors in three, two, one. Venom is not a f***ing horror character and Death Battle needs to get that through their heads. Here's why. <coughs> I've talked about Venom in a previous video, but you've chosen not to watch that video for some reason, so I'm gonna be repeating literally everything I say here. There are at least a couple of points that I didn't exactly touch upon in that video, so for those of you who did watch that video, give yourself some extra bragging rights in the comments. But let me just say that I do understand that all of these, let's just say, edgy traits from Venom are what made him popular to begin with. Not just working as a direct contrast to Peter, but also because it's just really fun to watch, in a similar vein to Carnage. But at the same time, there's a reason why nobody considers Venom and Carnage to be the same person, and why Marvel goes out of its way on multiple occasions to demonstrate that. Venom can be a tough character to write. One way of getting at least an easy start is to emphasize that Eddie Brock and the Clintar are two completely different entities. Yet despite this, they both want the same thing. They want a better life. They want to prove themselves to other people. But Eddie is just a down-on-his-luck guy who wants to be more honest about it, while the Clintar, while also very peaceful, often becomes obsessive and vicious. And while the Clintar definitely needs to take over Eddie to become Venom as the monster that people know him as, I'd argue that 
that the only reason that's possible is because it's playing into Eddie's desires and twisting them in a vengeful way, despite the fact that Eddie himself is not exactly like that. This is why I am a huge apologist for both of the Venom films. This is almost exactly like how they write Eddie, and I say it's very well done, aside from that toxic roommate nonsense from Let There Be Carnage, but everything else about it was great. Now, you might think that, oh, nobody really likes those movies, and even though it's very obvious that my name is Jonathan, not nobody, I'd also like to point out that it's not so dissimilar to how Eddie was written in the Spectacular Spider-Man cartoon, which a lot of people consider to be the best Spider-Man cartoon with Venom in particular being a big reason why people consider it to be the best Spider-Man cartoon. But if you want to focus on the savageness of Venom, I'd argue that it works best when they're both in agreement, when the two of them are setting aside their differences and agree with one another. Not only is it satisfying, but depending on the context, it wonderfully ties into the supposed horror aspects that people seem to like about Venom. And I just want to point out that when you exclusively focus on those aspects of Venom, he becomes really bland and boring, to a point where yes, you can just replace him with Carnage and nothing sufficient would change. But then we get to the death battle, and can I just say that Venom is characterized way worse than he was in his previous episode, which also did a poor job at characterizing him? And I'm not just saying that because he's played again by Adam Wenick, which, no offense, but why would you bring him back when his Venom wasn't even that good in the first place? Like, if you wanted Venom to have his Marvel vs. Capcom infinite voice, then you could just have him do that. In fact, these are the same voices, I swear to heaven on high. Why does this one get criticized yet the other one never does? Not only is this characterization just completely wrong, but it outright contradicts parts of the analysis. Remember when they dedicated a chunk of the analysis to how Eddie wanted to protect others? Yeah, let's have the animation feature the Clintar half-threatened to eat this kid for no reason and have Eddie not even bother to stop it. In fact, I'd argue that the setting was already a red flag. I get why it's a church, because both characters are associated with churches. That's a nice touch. But did you guys just forget that the only reason Eddie ever went to a church was to seek redemption and forgiveness? Why does he want to eat Krona when all they really did was just open a door and say hi? At least with Bane, you could contextualize it as if he was doing some elaborate gang operation. I mean, it's never once communicated ever, but you can do that. I fail to see why Eddie would just be okay with a Clintar wanting to eat this child for no reason. And then you have all these other moments, like him referencing a part of This Is Halloween, as well as the FNAF jump scare. I know people really like these bits, but I can't stand them. It's because it really hammers in how Death Battle does not understand Venom. Once again, this is swole carnage. All of this is stuff that he would do, not Venom. Though I will admit, I could imagine Venom weaponizing his tongue to swing Krona around. That was a pretty fun moment. Oh, and let's even have a moment where Eddie has a chance to speak by himself with no symbiote influence, but instead just have the Clintar come back and give a garbage speech about how Venom will haunt Krona forever or something. Again, all they did was open a door. Now look, I get that this doesn't bother people that much. I myself know of and have even talked with people who still really like this episode just because they get to hear Death Battle talking about Soul Eater. And you know what? I'm genuinely happy that people can find enjoyment out of this episode. But with me, you have to keep in mind that Venom is in my top five favorite Marvel characters of all time. Assuredly in terms of characters that Death Battle has ever used. But when I see Death Battle mischaracterize one of my all-time favorite characters not once, but twice, while doing an arguably Worst job the second time, that's not gonna make me like an episode very much. In fact, it's a lot like ra- Okay, I swear, I'm just as tired of making this comparison as you might be, and at some point I will stop, but... Venom vs. Krona is like Ragna vs. Soul, where if you're gonna misrepresent one of my favorite characters, you better damn well have the best f***ing animation possible. While this animation technically doesn't have too much wrong with it, it is so unbelievably boring! Krona's movement is accurate to the source material from what I've seen, and even the screech attacks are ripped straight from Soul Eater, so that's nice. And I kinda like the Black Blood scene. Krona gives a fairly solid delivery, and their face literally disappears appearing makes the scene uncanny in the best way, even though it feels like the blood is dropping frames once it bursts through the rooftop. Oh well. But aside from that, this is one of the most flaccid animations they've ever done. Like, you have Swole Carnage jumping very slowly across Krona, who just lets him web their sword. Even if it does nothing, that just makes it more unnecessary. And then you have the air battle, which kinda sucks. The Laughing Moon is an okay touch, I guess. And this shot of Krona duel grabbing another sword is a good setup, but the actual attacks are so bland. Literally just Season 1-esque dash attacks, but with worse sound design. And Krona's madness apparently shows 
levels up, but it's impossible to tell because it gets no transformation scene. And I did look up the clip as to what madness can look like, and I will admit, it is frightening! And that's just in the anime, I can only imagine how the manga makes it work. Maybe I should check out this series one day. But not only does Krona's madness barely have time to register, but there's no difference in personality or tone of voice to sell that. Maybe there was supposed to be, but they just happened to pick the wrong voice clips? I don't know. Gee, it's almost like the animation potential doesn't make this match more interesting. And even the track, Madness and Venom, this has got to be one of the most boring tracks in all of Death Battle. Mm, sorry, Death Race, not Death Battle. It's the exact same melody for almost the entire thing with minimal changes. I'll give Brandon credit for going into a different genre. Props for trying something new, but man, the track just makes it really boring and it doesn't accentuate any moment in the animation. Then we get to the kill where despite Venom giving a speech and okay, to his credit, he actually says we are Venom. That's one point it gets over Venom versus Bane, but then he just stops moving. Okay then? But then we get to the conclusion where they say that Venom can't handle 9 trillion tons of black blood, but they also don't give Venom any numbers for strength, so sure, Krona winning is correct, but that's in terms of outside factors. If we went by the episode's logic, of course Krona was gonna stomp because they gave Venom nothing for strength. Yeah, they do bring up decibels, and you could argue that because they brought him up in Blindary that they wouldn't need to go into extensive detail here. The thing is, while they did say that decibels scale logarithmically, they still gave Quan quantifiable numbers, saying that Dinah's was around 597 megatons of TNT, for example. So yeah, even without Venom's character assassination, the episode is just a set of rundowns that give me nothing, a fight that is just meh at best, dull music that's so boring and lifeless you wouldn't even hear it in a coffee shop, a less than generic kill, choreography that doesn't make the most of its potential, implying that there was any to begin with, and a conclusion that gives virtually no numbers. But when you do factor in Venom's misrepresentation, it becomes one of the most frustrating episodes to talk about, at least for me. Hmm, I think there was another episode where I've heard something like this before. But I will admit, despite what I may have been leading on, I do think it's better than Venom vs. Bane, since Venom got a surprisingly better analysis and the animation is competent at least. But I want to give it a lower score so badly, you have no idea, but if I did, even I'd be stretching quite a bit. But still, 31 out of 100. Because let's be real, being better than Venom vs. Bane is such a nothing accomplishment. Venom vs. Zato won when, and Krona vs. literally any fictional character not named Venom or Carnage when. <laughs> Oh wait, I forgot to talk about the bonus episode. <laughs> Now we're at a bonus episode that actually wants to take itself seriously. Okay, I've talked about bonus episodes, but they were definitely more like sellouts. But this one, okay, it is definitely meant as an advertisement for the Amazon original series, The Boys. But it also wanted to feel like an actual episode. Here's a compromise. I'm not gonna put it on the all series ranking, but just to satisfy what people will think of it, I'll share my general thoughts on the episode and say where I would put it in the season ranking. And now with that out of the way, let's talk about the first legitimate bonus episode of Death battle history. When I first watched the rundown, I did not want to check out the series. It felt like another generic mainstream live-action original series that happened to have some mildly interesting plot points, but it wasn't enough for me to check it out. Though just so everyone knows, I did get around to checking out The Boys, and it is a phenomenal show, and I cannot wait for Season 4, even if a certain part of Season 3 Episode 1 is the most uncomfortable experience I've ever had watching anything ever. But throughout everyone's rundown, really, they have a running gag where Black Noir is trying to keep Wiz and Boomstick in check, and yeah, it's just as lame as it's sounds. In fact, he's a part of the Seven, so why was he excluded from the fight? They analyzed him as much as they analyzed every other combatant, so why is he not a part of this fight? And aside from Kimiko, the other boys aren't exactly fighters, so it makes sense why they're not a part of the simula- oh, oh, sorry, sorry, we don't use those words here. I think the most enjoyment I got was when Wiz tried to prove that they're not biased. <laughs> I like that part. But when the totally not a simulation, I swear guys, actually begins, we do have some actually really well-made looking sprites. And they're animated pretty well too. Solid puppet rigging, good looking expressions, the deep is voiced by Greninja, lots of interesting stuff here. But aside from that, there is a lot of problems here. Adrian says he can handle them all, but despite having a wide opportunity to blitz Billy, he just goes away and ignores him. Then you have Queen Maeve uppercutting A-Train and it sends him in the same direction he was already running. In general, A-Train's 
death makes no sense. Seeing him getting blinded is actually a really cool moment, but Maeve just moves her fist in his direction and he dies. Okay, I think they were trying to convey that she killed him via standing still, but then she gets knocked back anyway. Why even? Then the building catches on fire and I like how Starlight is the only one freaking out over it, but I am only doing that because her last words are something out of character now that I know who she is. Also, Billy apparently sidestepped away from Starlight's beam and somehow Starlight never once thought to move her arms a little to the side, nor to move out of the building that's about to fall on top of her. But then the baby laser ends it, which was not in the analysis at all because they didn't bother saying what most of these characters can do. Oh, and you might have noticed why I didn't talk about Homelander. There is nothing to talk about. They said he was gonna act as referee, yet he does nothing until Billy wins. Like, what was the point of Homelander even being here? Oh, and also, I don't like Billy's voice in this. He reminds me of the sniper from Team Fortress 2, not the soft-spoken hard-ass he is in the series. The other voices are mostly fine though, especially Yang Ya as Homelander. Hope we get to see him again one day. Although they end up teasing the fight with Stormfront, which, okay, this has nothing to do with the episode, but I just want to say, I know exactly where the name Stormfront comes from, and I both love and hate that. <laughs> But if you just stick with the episode, then that's it. But they dedicated an entirely separate video for a matchup that they say has a canon answer. You're telling me that Wally vs. Archie Sonic wasn't worthy of a conclusion longer than three minutes, yet this matchup was? This came directly after Wally vs. Sonic, so it's like, why even? But I watched it anyway, in case you were really, really wondering who was gonna win, and how in the hell is this wrong by its own logic? Like, a lot of people bring up the laser baby thing and how it isn't mentioned until this video. Let's ignore that and pretend that it was brought up in the analysis before the fight, and that it is in fact a part of his standard arsenal. How come the laser baby's plasma was given a strength calc, yet Starlight's wasn't? And didn't they say that A-Train would be able to bliss any of them, since he was faster than all of them? And didn't they also say that Billy was basically human level? How in the hell did A-Train not blitz Billy? Yeah, they say A-Train didn't know jack about it, and Billy could keep his distance. Good luck trying to keep your distance against someone that can run thousands of times faster than you. And what's preventing Starlight's plasma from being just as powerful? I really, really don't get it. <laughs> Never thought I'd see a Guts vs. Nightmare-esque conclusion from this series, let alone in the modern era of death battle, but here we are! If it was just a fight, I probably would have given it like a 4 out of 10 or something, but this stupid post-fight breakdown is so bad that it dropped it to a 3 out of 10. And if I were to give it an exact placement, probably somewhere in the middle end of the 3 out of 10 or something? I don't know. However, Ben says that he did have fun making this, and you know what, in spite of its many, many glaring issues, it's good to know that he did. And I would not object to it seeing another Death Battle episode featuring the boys. But if they do, I would want it to focus on the character moments of the show. One with a setup that portrays its characters as well as the series does. Something that makes it feel less like a Death Battle episode, and more like an episode of the boys. Even if it has to fit within three minutes, it can be something that gives it an excellent setup and a satisfying ending. Eh, maybe when they get around to doing X-23 versus Kimiko. Also, I am sick of this whack-ass superhero music! <laughs> Oh wait, this episode's getting delayed, so I still can't talk about it yet? But there's gonna be an episode coming before it? Okay then, I guess. But I swear to heaven on high, this is yet another matchup featuring a Marvel- Finally, a fighting game themed matchup. You know the last time we saw one of these was in season five with Ryu versus Jin? I mean, I guess you could also argue Johnny Cage versus Captain Falcon, but the F-Zero fanboy inside me refuses to believe that. So this is the first fighting game matchup of the entire show since season five. And not only that, but it features two supposedly niche series, Killer Instinct and believe it or not, Darkstalkers. The latter of which has not had a single episode since season one. While this was obviously unintentional, the fact that it still got an extended trailer more reminiscent of the classic Next Time teasers from the first three seasons makes me super happy. So this was the episode of the season I was the most excited to revisit. Aside from Cable vs. Booster Doug Walker, of course. Learning about Saber Wolf was cool. I liked hearing them talk about the castle and Boomstick trying to say he's a vampire, which is... 
Also cool, it works as a joke in a similar way to when he tried to convince Wiz that Link is a fairy. That's very season one, but for once, I mean that as a good thing. Plus, in general, it was just really nice to see Killer Instinct talked about on Modern Death Battle. Even if it's not to the same degree of gravitas that Balrog vs. TJ had, it's still better than every other Killer Instinct episode, so no worries. But Jolantel Bane's analysis is so, so good, man. Aside from Booster James Rolfe, John has my favorite rundown of the season. The royalty-free music that they use fits astronomically well, and there are even a couple of good jokes here and there, plus a boomstick dad joke. Well, I did say Booster Gold had a better rundown. On top of that, they flesh out the world of Darkstalkers, cover his backstory, talk about his fighting style while directly name-dropping his style's contrast with John's werewolf physique, go into his friendship with Felicia, and end it off with one of my favorite ending notes of the show, where they say he maintains the control of his werewolf self and commits to a life of compassion. I have no forgiveness left, monster. Uh. Liam actually gave an explanation for this. He said that his interpretation of the scene is that John view Saberwolf as a werewolf who failed to control himself. I can actually buy this interpretation. Saberwolf's analysis goes into heavy detail over how Conrad never managed to control his werewolf self, even going over how he got addicted to opiates that drove him even further to madness. And when you combine that with how John's rundown goes into equally heavy detail over how he successfully controls himself, along with how his rundown ends with this... But John will always be a dark stalker. If he relapses, he'll be as deadly as ever. Be as deadly as ever. Deadly as ever. Deadly, 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 deadly. I have no forgiveness. So yeah, I definitely buy Liam's interpretation, especially since there are multiple corpses that Saberwolf was feeding off of. I guess it could have been communicated a little better. Otherwise, I think Liam made it clear enough. But that's the most defense you'll get out of me for the first third of this fight as woof. Or actually, wait, no, that's too easy. So, uh, meow, did you mess all of this up? The sound design is way, way worse than I remember. Not only do we have wrong sound effects and sound effects with no impact, but multiple instances of missing sound effects. Yeah, this really is super close to Metal Sonic vs. Zero tier sound design in so many ways. I guess there is some good or at least adequate sound design, but the bad and unfinished sound design really does overtake this. But I think there might be something of an explanation for this. Not to defend it, mind you, but I think they were trying to sell the thematic victory even more, with Conrad's attacks being more vicious, and John's attacks, at least when he's not going into beast mode, having more finesse to them, reminiscent of his martial arts skills and experience. However, while the animation and choreography do a pretty good job of conveying that, more on that later, the sound design, which tends to make up most of what you see, kind of hinders that. Even John's nunchucks don't have that much impact since their hits sound very similar to John's basic punches and kicks. There were people who didn't even know John was using his nunchucks here. I knew those were nunchucks because I recognized the animation, but I knew of many other people who didn't. When the nunchucks are destroying the bats, that makes sense to me, because the bats are more or less dissolving. But when they're attacking Conrad's face... No. Plus, there's also this flaccid standing here moment, which also has the same sound effects, and no, it does not deserve the meme. I honestly think this is some of the worst sound design of the entire season, so why do people like this episode? It's because of everything else! Sound design aside, this fight has some of my favorite choreography of the season, and to a rough extent, the entire show. Like you have Conrad slamming John against the wall, which knocks over the lantern, causing the whole alleyway to catch fire, and then yeets John through the fire! I mean, sure, John doesn't visibly burn, but he does bleed from it, which is a very nice touch. In general, the fight uses blood incredibly well. When John's bleeding, it's meant to convey injury, like when he sheds a little bit of blood after getting thrown through the flames, or when the skin from his shoulder gets torn off and he stops fighting to hold his wound. Meanwhile, when Conrad is bleeding, it's meant to convey bloodlust, like when he's bleeding through his teeth and says, Say you taste enticing. But the actual voice actor says the line more incoherently, which I think it's a really nice touch to sell Conrad's monstrous nature. I guess maybe the line was always vague to me, but at the same time, the way that this episode is written implies that this is a feral saber wolf who lost control completely, so his incoherent voice makes sense to me. It's also why I'm okay with Conrad using a corpse to block the fire dragon. Sure, it weirdly has no impact for some reason, but that's kind of the point since Conrad was hastily thinking on his feet. 
And to think we're still not done with the rest of the choreography, because holy goodness, even the walls are used very well. With Conrad using the walls to hop over the fire, and then they're both fighting on one of the walls, but then John Pyle drives him with his mouth! And of course, you have the fire being used to make Conrad's batch catch fire, as opposed to how it works in the games. Thanks for leaving your gun in that lantern, Shekhov. Very much appreciated. Even more so than this line delivery here. It's the fury of the beast! This is the voice of Jello Apocalypse, by the way. But then we get to the graveyard scene. It's pretty straightforward stuff, but the blood is poured out of both combatants, likely to show how they're both unleashing their inner beasts. Makes sense when the blood moon comes out and forces John to say this. Oh. Not like him. But we got no time for that because John tears out his intestines and strangles him with them. them. But then the blood moon is hidden behind the clouds, which allows John to control himself and use the dragon to break free. And then the color change in his eyes alone has some of the best sound design, and I don't know how I feel about that actually. But then the blood moon comes back, and John gives my favorite line delivery of the entire season. I'm no monster, but tonight I'll make an exception. You know why this is my favorite line read of the season? It's because John has tried to control himself throughout the whole fight, but he has lost so much blood and literally got choked by his own organs. And since the kill is no holds barred, it's implied that he has had enough of Conrad's sh**. He's earned the right to kill a man! The Blood Moon really has unleashed the Fury of the Beast, and he does this in a Mad World-esque visual style with the monochrome colors being vital for making the red blood stand out. And then Conrad's cry lets out the last bit of humanity he had left. Best death of the season, actually! And the conclusion? Okay, it's mostly good. I like the thematic edge it has and how the stuff about John's more precise attacks and better experience were mentioned, and I like how the animation lived up to it all, but then they compare lifting strength to attack potency, and it's weird. But in their defense, I don't think I need to tell you that being on par with someone who can sink the entirety of ancient Egypt is more impressive than tanking a kiloton meteor that, honestly, looks more like a boulder than a meteor. Man, there is a lot to be excited with this episode, and I really wanted it to be at least my second or third favorite of the season, but ah, oh, that absolutely F-tier sound design. It seriously holds it back for me, but still, 84 out of 100 is a score to be proud of, straight up. <laughs> Oh, hey, wait a second. Um, I already used this episode's music at the very beginning of this ranking retrospective, so, uh, gonna have to shoehorn some more Crystal Bearers music. Yeah, the reason this episode got delayed was because they wanted it to line up with the premiere of Red vs. Blue Zero, which nobody liked. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> What would have happened if they had stopped dicking around and actually just fought for real? Wait, wait, hang on. I was under the impression that this was also going to be canon to Red vs. Blue itself. Like, I know it's kind of more of a what-if scenario, and I did have people tell me that Meta vs. Carolina was the same case. I don't know, man. I don't think it needs to be a dedicated crossover since they already did that, but given that I'm still conflicted on the whole canonicity of it, uh, please elaborate in the comments. I just want to talk about the episode now. This one is kind of divisive amongst the Red vs. Blue community, so... So keep in mind, everything I say is from the perspective of an outsider. I will say that right off the bat, Boomstick having nom flashbacks when he says Goku vs Superman sends me. <laughs> and Boomstick having a clear bias for Sarge is kind of a subtle Boomstick dad joke, and I like that. Although why did he mispronounce Mjolnir when he heard Wiz say it correctly? That's not how the Boomstick mispronunciation jokes work. Other than that, I'd say I liked it. But I like the Blues rundown way more. It has a better cutaway with how casual Wiz and Boomstick are about the fact that they may have killed Dummy by accident. Accident. And then they also had Caboose being stronger than Goku, based as hell. And both rundowns make quite a few references to the show, but unlike in something akin to Jotaro vs Kenshiro, they flow with the analyses rather than exist for no reason other than because it's funny to a very niche group of people. It comes across like this was written by real Red vs Blue fans, much like Meta vs Carolina. And then onto the fight, and I'll talk about the voice acting first. Caboose's original voice actor missed the calling, but I think the substitute that they got is pretty good. I think it's still a fun voice. 
And again, there is some stuff about how the voices are a little off, like how Griff sounds bored, for instance. And in general, there are some moments where the characters aren't acting like themselves. I can definitely see that with moments like Sarge being happy to see Griff die for some reason. And also Sarge dies to a basic grenade that he just lets himself get hit by for some reason. Whatever, man. But personally, I still thought that the fight was a lot of fun. In a junk food kind of way, I'm aware, but I still like junk food from time to time. The rest of the dialogue is entertaining. The voice acting, I'd say, is nice overall. The hand-to-hand -hand combat is really well done. Blood Gulch Bedlam is one of my favorite tracks of the season, and it even has the janky head movements that Red vs. Blue is known for. I really like this attention to detail. And as far as I'm aware, that's the only instance of jank I could find in the episode, so yay! Not to mention we get a lot of these really cool action moments, because this fight is roughly five minutes long. And to put this into perspective, if you remove the King Kai scene, that is the exact same length as Goku vs. Superman 2. I am also including the extended setup to the fight. Another reason why Goku vs. Superman 2 is a load of bollocks that never should have existed to begin with. But yeah, again, I don't have that much to say. I mean, the action is fun, the dialogue and voice acting is flawed, but also kind of enjoyable, at least for me. And while a good chunk of the death is ass pulls and screams of time restraints, I still say it's a good episode. 75 out of 100. Not much to say, but the next one, however... Oof. Look, I'll get to the Marvel and DC oversaturation later, but I do know that this was the last draw for many people. Well, supposedly. No one was hyped for this matchup, people were disappointed that it happened, both Barbara and Gwen had far more popular and interesting opponents, and with Gwen at least, people still really want them to return. Personally, I don't think the matchup is even that bad. I'd argue that it's something of an inverse of Venom vs. Bane, where they become heroes inspired by Bruce and Peter respectively, and rely on their detective skills to overcome their limitations and insecurities to become a strong ally. Not amazing, but I think it's a lot more than Bats vs. Spidey but girl, like what other people may have thought. And I also thought that the rundowns were really solid. Batgirl's rundown has moments like Boomstick being a feminist, okay, pretty based, and I laughed at the cutaway gag with how Dummy acts like a drunkard when he's shocked. Oh hey, it's like Futurama. And at first I thought they were covering her feats a little too fast, but then you notice that they mostly focus on her speed and durability feats before they follow up with how she got paralyzed from the waist down. And then they proceed to talk about her hacking abilities, which were especially useful during this time, and then they say that she could still dodge bullets in a wheelchair. Then after they bring up her implants, they talk about her strength feats, implying that this experience made her a stronger person. That is such cool writing and structure. Although they do make a Tiger King reference in 2020, um, that's quite a line, not gonna lie, Boomstick. But as for Gwen's analysis, it's actually better. They cover all sorts of differences between Gwen's timeline and the normal one, akin to Miles vs. Static, which I guess kind of defeats the appeal. But it normalized the trend of that godlike comic book editing. Yes, previous episodes had it as well, but this one has my favorite editing of the season. Most notably this one right here. Ooh, that is smooth. Though the writing does have a couple of moments holding it back for me. Like the one joke about a woman being on the roof and Boomstick saying, Yes, please! Okay, I really need to retire this Grenda voice, but still, so much for Boomstick being a feminist, am I right? I especially like the parts where they cover her days as a wanted fugitive. They take it seriously when they need to, like with Peter dying in her arms, and they crack jokes about it when it's appropriate, like when Boomstick makes fun of people not knowing that Gwen Stacy was Spider-Gwen. Hell, Wiz even asks Boomstick if he's paying attention. This line works better than you'd think, because Wiz never once refers to her as Spider-Gwen until the results. But in the rundown, he'll occasionally call her Gwen or Miss Stacy, but he normally calls her Spider-Woman, and Boomstick calls her Spider-Gwen. Again, that's pretty clever writing. But then we get to the fight, and uh, this is the sole reason why it's the least favorite of the season for a lot of people, and uh, what do you want me to say? Jank, 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 lack of arsenal, stiff posing, bad looking web effects, jank, 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 awful choreography, scenes that make no sense, a good kill ruined by an ugly face from an already hideous model, jank, 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 you've heard it all before! Like, none of this should really surprise you. Except for the part when I say that this episode is not my least favorite of the season. For Martel's sake, guys, I practically gave you the answer! This is four seasons in a row! Do you really think I'm that predictable? I swear to heaven on high, if we go five for five, I'm gonna start wearing my Time Haunt shirt in public! I will say that this is primarily because of how good the analyses were. If an episode has a terrible fight, but a really good analysis, or at least one that I got enough enjoyment out of, with no caveats, then there's no way it's gonna fall below a 30. Aside from maybe Fulgore versus Sector, depending on how you interpret my analysis of the analysis, I feel like I've been really consistent with this. 
Okay, so the episode has really good analyses, and Venom vs. Krona is your least favorite. But surely Bat Gwen is your second least favorite, right? Mmm. No, actually. I also think this is better than Danny vs. Jake, because if you remember, that episode had analyses that were frustratingly boring to sit through. Okay, so this is at least in your bottom three, right? I think I'll get back to you on that. Until then, I want to go over why I don't hate this episode as much as other people do. Susie Young's Gwen is actually a really solid performance. It doesn't get nearly enough credit. Like, she's snarky yet charismatic. It's the exact kind of tone you'd expect from one of these web crawlers. Which, by the way, I really don't get the hate for the dialogue. Some of it's bad. Barbara's dialogue in particular is a bit cringy. But the ending exchange, I don't understand the hate for. I mean, yeah, it's supposedly obvious that Barbara was gonna lose, but that's kind of the point? I mean, she's running out of gadgets, she can't use any more batterings, and she's trying to use a last resort while her opponent effortlessly dodges everything she does. Plus, Gwen's last line is delivered with smugness and sarcasm. Not only is that in line with how she normally is in her main media, but also with how she's portrayed in the fight. Unless you're trying to tell me that a Spider-Man character would never try to spout out quirky quips. And there's also this scene that people say is like a Shekhov's gun, but no? Not even half a percent close. When Death Battle has used other Shekhov's gun moments, they put way more emphasis on the scene. I guess with exception of Roshi vs. Jiraiya's I've been back on the beach the whole time, but here, it's once again supposed to convey that Barbara is running out of her gadgets. Like, she has a pretty solid advantage early on, but eventually, Gwen starts wearing down her arsenal just by kicking it. Or something. Like, seriously, how is this supposed to be a Shekhov's gun scene? I genuinely don't understand. I'm pretty sure they would happen earlier in the fight, not in the second half where Gwen starts to dominate. Don't get me wrong, this animation is still abysmal. I can never say an episode with a shot like this is good in any way, even if it has an amazing analysis. Plus, the other criticism the animation gets, yeah, I agree with them. But still, it's not my least favorite of the season, Copen C, 36 out of 100, and yes, that is higher than Goku vs. Superman 2, why do you ask? I'll admit, I've never understood the appeal of this matchup, but to any One Piece fans or Rock Lee fans, was this matchup super thematic in any way? Was it a long-time legacy anime fight? Or was it hard-carried by how good the one-minute melee was? Because I've seen the connections on the Death Battle Wiki, and I'm not super convinced. Though I am happy that fans of the matchup got something they wanted, especially since the last One Piece episode was more than three and a half years ago. Sanji's analysis was meh. It has some cool editing at the start, but nowhere else. Learning about his character for a bit was okay. I like the royal free pirate music they used. Other than that, it felt like a respect thread with some lame jokes and a predictable cutaway gag. Oh, and it also has this line here. That's One Piece in a nutshell. A very, very long story. How tactful. And as for Rock Lee's analysis, look, I hate to say this, but it feels like a much lesser version of Might Guys. And I know that's obvious because that was a season finale, and I wasn't expecting Rock Lee's to be that much better than Might Guys' analysis, or even better in the first place. And overall, I think that making comparisons to that episode is unfair, and I'm gonna try not to do that when I talk about the fight, but given how they directly say that multiple powerful Naruto characters have been on Death Battle before, only to play the lack of talent thing completely straight as if Might Guy never appeared on the show, it was tough for me to not do that. Not to mention that they play almost the exact same beats as guys, but with literally none of the gravitas. Other than that, the rundown was yet another boring respect thread. And the fight is about just as boring, with a really, really terrible setup that apparently assassinates both characters. Rock Lee's is definitely talked about more often, as he believes it is impossible to dislike food, and his favorite food is medium spicy curry. And yet his face goes red for some reason as if it was spicy curry. Like, what? However, once I finished talking about season in six, I got a handful of people letting me know that Sanji was also out of character. I knew about this beforehand, and I was definitely gonna talk about it no matter what, but I had no idea how to address the criticism. Just because I'm not a One Piece guy. From what other people have told me, and from what I'm able to understand from it, the analysis fails to cover a very crucial part of his story as to why he considers food so important to his life. And while he does brag about his food, he doesn't get violent about it, and he would certainly never start a fight. The only time he would ever start a fight over over something food related is if somebody's wasting their food. And if that's true, then all Rock Lee would need to do was just have his pounding of the fist actually knock over the bowl. But even if these were in character, I don't like anything about this fight. Or at least maybe it does have plenty of cool moments, but I'm too distracted by Rock Lee's tiny baby arms to care. Plus, the sound design is very weird. Like, why is it that Sanji's kicks feel like either clanging metal shovels or aggressive keyboard typing? 
Rockley has this sound design issue as well, on top of his really bad looking sprite. Like, what the f is this supposed to be? But his drunken form lasts way too long, and his initial rambling goes on for about 13 full seconds. It's not funny, and it adds nothing to the fight otherwise, but that has nothing to do with Mark Phillips' voice acting. I haven't checked out too much of his stuff, but I'm sure he's a great guy, has a lot of talent, and on paper at least, I like his voice for the character, and also it was a lifetime dream of his to play Rock Lee, so I'm glad that he got to cross something off of his bucket list. Oh, and of course, young uh, Sanji is pretty good. It's just the writing really drags it down for me. Not helped by the animation feeling like Hercule vs. Dan if it was played completely straight. In general, a lot of the dialogue is overwritten. I've already mentioned the drunken rambling Rock does, but the ending lines here are overwritten to a point where it feels like placeholder dialogue. And it's not like the fighting outside of the restaurant is much better, but Sanji making his leg catch fire was pretty cool. And Rock turning into handsome Squidward was a clever use of memes, which is more impressive given how Death Battle was really bad with using memes and low-hanging fruit, but this one was well implemented because it's something they said Sanji could do in the analysis, so uh, good job, you made me laugh at a handsome Squidward meme. But then you have moments like Rock speed running through the 8 gates, and the 8th gate bending the space around Sanji's leg, okay this looks vicious! But Sanji seemingly not giving a shit about his leg exploding is really lame. Even Goro and Machamp looked at their severed arms. Sanji actually doesn't react. I will say that this animation looks brutal and for once has good sound design. Kinda wish it ended right there, but we have to have that overwritten ending sequitur and kill that barely looks like an attack that does anything. I'm sure that the antimatter kick is really deadly, but this doesn't convince me that it was. I will say that Full Course Will is a very snazzy track. I like it a lot. I pointed out how Jazz is my favorite music genre alongside rock and roll and blues. But then again, it's not something I would go to the episode to listen to again, as it's a very boring and sloppy episode. Not as bad as Danny vs. Jake, since nothing about it annoyed me aside from, I guess, the setup, but I don't know the characters, so it didn't bother me as much as it did other people. However, by some stroke of a demonic intervention, this episode is worse than Batgirl vs. Spider-Gwen. At least that episode had adequate sound design, but Sanji vs. Rock Lee? Nope, couldn't have that either. 35 out of 100. Yeah. Okay, I gotta be honest with this next one. I'm a bit hesitant to talk about this episode. Not that it's a demon of mine, but it is in fact a very special episode. Like, fully scripted rundown special. This next episode is not just the season finale, but it's also the episode to celebrate 10 years of Death Battle. Even before season 8, this episode was to commemorate its anniversary. Before the delays, of course, but eh, what can you do? Despite such an impressive milestone, much like the other milestone episodes, it's very volatile among the community. Some people love it, some people loathe it, some people don't have much of an opinion on it, and a part of me was kinda dreading this episode because, aside from episodes I had literally no opinion on, I have had the least amount of expectations for this revisit compared to every other episode of the show. I had no clue what this episode was gonna give me, or the thoughts I was gonna have for this episode, even as I started this retrospective series. Well, we finally crossed that bridge, so, uh, it's time to pay the toll. For a season with episodes criticized for wasting characters on comic book characters, this is probably the only time where that's not the case. It's a long time legacy matchup that has been requested since long before Hulk's first episode, which we would have gotten instead had the worst superhero movie of all time not had Doomsday in it, even though it kind of didn't, but whatever, whatever. It was foreshadowed in Batgirl vs. Spider-Gwen, even though Barbara will never get to see her most wanted matchup. Don't worry, Barbara. Neither will I. But since they're using other versions of the characters, that being Devil Hulk and Dragon Ball Super Broly, it makes the matchup that much more interesting. Super Broly's always afraid of his own power, and from what I've heard of Devil Hulk, he's also very protective and caring of Bruce and even other children. I mean, yeah, you could always use the normal versions of Hulk and Broly, but that would pretty much just make it Hulk vs. Doomsday 2. So I'm glad that these versions of Hulk and Broly exist and became more prominent in the episode. And for being one of the few modern Death Battle episodes to have more than 5 million views, I'd say it paid off pretty well. This thumbnail goes hard, by the way. But let's see how this episode turned out, starting with the analyses. Hulk's analysis was off to a rough start. I'm fine with them retreading old ground by talking about his abusive dad, but then they bring up how the Hulk came out immediately after that. This was not paced as well as it was in his previous episode. I understand that they have all sorts of new stuff to cover, like Banner's multitude of personalities and the stuff about the one below all, but I wish it was built up like it was in his last episode, where they go over his childhood trauma and then go into how the Hulk was unleashed. 
After that, it does get better. Like the joke about the Green Scar Hulk's other kind of smashing, being 120 times stronger than Savage Hulk. Boomstick's dialogue is also vague enough where you wouldn't immediately assume that he's referring to sex, but when you look back at his word choices, oh, I get it. I also like the ending note on how he managed to overpower the spirits of his father along with the one below all, even though the conclusion completely undermines that point, but let's not go there yet, because we've got another analysis to look at. Broly's rundown I was hoping would be better than Hulk's due to not only being a newcomer on the show, but also due to a different version of Broly being focused on. And it was better, in some ways. I liked hearing about the differences between the two Broly's, with Boomstick defending classic Broly's backstory, and in general, he's an all-around supporter of Broly. But it's not to the point of being biased since he kind of acted like this for Hulk as well. I don't actively dislike any part of his analysis, but again, they retread some older ground, like the infamous universe shockwaves. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna talk about this feat anymore, but rest assured, you will be seeing this feat in nearly every Dragon Ball episode going forward. I guess that's not entirely their fault since Broly's feats are based around scaling, but it still would have been nice if they brought up some feats of his own. Like with Hulk, they say that he can lift up a ginormous mountain or punch asteroids, stuff that he has done by himself and is quantifiable. But they don't do that for Broly. Now, I do understand why people have a problem with scaling, but I think scaling should be used to help a victor as some characters have little to work with on their own to a point where it's required. Honestly, in terms of characters that Death Battle has covered, you'd be surprised as to how many of their strongest feats don't come from themselves. This is why you always see stuff like the Naruto Moonslide or Moderus Lasers or, yes, the Universe Shockwaves, because there's not always an abundance of feats to work with, especially when it comes down to the strongest feats in a character's verse. And this analysis doesn't immediately have this issue, but we'll get there later, because this fight has so much to talk about. First, we see this shot of Broly sitting by himself, all sad, but then there's this shot where his hair is blocking out the sun, then a deer walks up to him, and Broly's face becomes brighter. Not just with his smile, but with the sun gleaming on his face now that it is no longer being blocked by his hair. It's honestly a beautifully done scene, especially with the jarring shift in the sky growing darker as Hulk falls onto the planet's surface, scaring the deer away. Hey, spiky hair man, what's this beauty planet? You scared them away. You are making me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. Show me. I think that the deliveries here represent the tone we're in for. Before we get into that, I'd like to say that Ikari is the perfect music for this episode. Now, I know that I said Hulk vs. Doomsday had the exact kind of music I'd want in a Hulk episode, but let me emphasize that. The exact kind of music I want in a Hulk episode. Hulk vs. Broly feels more like a Broly episode to me. Not to the point of it being Broly featuring Hulk, not just because Banner gets some cool moments, but also because he's giving off the vibe of a tough trainer who often encourages Broly to give into his anger. I don't know, that's just how I've always seen it. And the music coupled with this opening exchange kind of leads me to believe in that interpretation. And in general, I think that this dynamic works for both characters immensely. The analysis mentions how Banner was able to make peace with the Hulk inside of him while Broly was never able to control his own power. And given how Devil Hulk Hulk apparently taunts his opponents often, at least from what I've heard, I think this setup makes a lot of sense. And in terms of the track, it feels like there's some underlying rage itching to come out. Like Broly is in a fight where he needs to unleash that rage, and he does when the chorus kicks in the second time. Hell, even the lyrics are about how his power is too great. Whether you look at this as Hulk boasting about how he's the strongest there is, or Broly warning Hulk about his power, the lyrics match the tone of the fight superbly. Also, the track art credits Daniel Vincent Galvin as a lyrics writer and a vocalist this time. Nice! But now let's talk about the overall look of the fight. I've seen a lot of people say that they don't like Hulk's model, and yeah, he does look a bit chunky at points, and his head looks weirdly proportioned in this shot, but other than that, I actually really like the way it looks. I like the efforts made to make his model not only match Broly's, but fuse Marvel's art style with Dragon Ball, with the sharpened lines in his muscles, the bushy eyebrows, that smug grin I outspokenly appreciate so much, and his intimidating eyes. I believe that this is more of an edited version of his model from Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, especially since the upper body proportions look similar, and the green hue is basically the same. But either way, props to the modeling team for making Hulk look different in an art style without coming across as too jarring. And of course, Broly's model also looks good, albeit kind of flat at points, and in general his aura doesn't always look perfect, but his expressions are on point and he's usually rendered really well. But what really makes the aesthetic work for me are the visuals. The VFX is truly beautiful. The hand-drawn aura trails blend in with the fight incredibly, Broly's projectiles are bright and deadly, 
World Breaker Hulk looks better than in his previous episode with that green aura and glowing green eyes, and the cosmic environment admittedly doesn't look as good as it does in Thanos vs. Darkseid, but once they break reality, yeah, this has better visuals than anything in Thanos vs. Darkseid. But while the fight looks really good, it's not about how it looks, it's about how it animates. Or, in this case, how it sounds. Yeah, this episode's sound design has been passionately criticized to where they claim it's bad to an absurd degree. As if Metal Sonic vs. Zero, Sanji vs. Broccoli, and Saber Wolf vs. John Talbain never happened. Look, I get that some people aren't as bothered by the sound design in those episodes, and okay, but honestly, I wouldn't even say that Hulk vs. Broly has the worst sound design of the season. It only checks off half the boxes, whereas Conrad vs. John and Sanji vs. Lee checked off every box of bad sound design and was prevalent throughout the entire fight. So it's weird that Hulk vs. Broly is the only one that gets constantly bullied for it. Maybe that might have something to do with this being the 10th anniversary episode, as well as the season finale, as well as how it goes to a cosmic scale, but at the same time, Thanos vs. Darkseid- okay, I talk about this episode more than Ragnar vs. Soul, I swear to heaven on high. But Thanos vs. Darkseid also received this criticism in sound design, and while it does get criticized, not to this degree, where this shot is often used as the pinnacle of bad sound design, or what moments with low impact look like, and I mean- What's so bad about this aside from virtually nothing? The sound effects are adequately chosen, they're layered well, they're able to convey the planet is indeed exploding, and you can still see the explosion and hear the sound effects after they cut to the next shot. I have no idea why this clip gets so much hate. Is it because they don't linger on the shot for a thousand years? Oh, okay, hang on, hang on. I think I know where this criticism comes from. They're just using the wrong planet shot. I reckon this is the shot that people are actually thinking of. It does go by very fast, and although the sound effects are also fine, they're cut off too quickly, unlike that other planet shot. However, what these shots are meant to convey is that the planets exploding are a byproduct of their fight. That's also the point of this galaxy shot. I think there could have been at least one or two more planets getting destroyed, maybe even some stars exploding along with them, but the intent is still pretty clear to me, especially with this shot of reality breaking just by them punching. Or fist bumping as, what is this posing? So yeah, I don't think that the sound design is that bad as what a part of the community randomly feels like thinking. Aside from the weak punches, I agree with those. The first few punches I can excuse, but not these. <laughs> By the way, I've had people tell me that Hulk vs. Doomsday's hits weren't just meaty in the strongest attacks, but in every single hit, and you really feel the impact in every single one. <laughs> No, you don't. If I say that Hulk smacking his pecs has more impact than every attack in Hulk vs. Doomsday combined, how many people will I be pissing off? I think that this episode has at least a few strong feeling attacks, like this shot of Hulk getting dunked into the ground, Broly getting yeeted into a mountain, Hulk getting his head torn off, which is a nice callback to Hulk vs. Doomsday, by the way, his healing factor fixing his face, Hulk leaping into space, the headbutt fight at the end, and this whole section right here. <laughs> But with all that being said, I think that the most damning use of sound design is this. He hasn't even got a body! Now don't get me wrong, the shot of Broly's eyes breaking into a red glow is awesome. But what follows is the actual worst sound design in the entire episode. Is a little view the best you could do for a transformation like this? Now obviously I wasn't expecting it to be similar to the same transformation as in the Super Broly movie, but this has the exact same doinky energy as Soul Dragon install. Yes, that eye shot single-handedly makes it better, but if it didn't have that, I would have outright said that Broly's transformation is the worst transformation in the entire series. And that's almost exclusively because of sound design. And I guess the effects looking a bit inconsistent at points, but that's not a big deal to me. Oh, and uh, Hulk's immortality reference is bad. I know it's supposed to be like it is in the comments, but the line sounds like a parody, the transition is just a hard cut, and the door's glow is cut off at first. Okay, I'm getting a little too negative, so let's talk about some positives. Like, for instance, Am I the only person who thinks that Hulk's voice in this episode is so much better than his older one? His old voice wasn't bad, I especially admire his World Breaker Hulk transformation, but his other lines had the exact same cadence throughout the whole fight and sounded higher pitched than I would have liked, and not in the high pitched but still monstrous way like Fred Tatasciore's take. But here, Richard Barcenas has a lower pitched Hulk that builds up his rage way better. Of course, his standout line is when he uses Broly's catchphrase after he used his, but my favorite line from him is actually this one. Yes, show me! Break the world! Break everything! The amount of hype and energy put into this line gives me life. 
Fitting that this is his last line of dialogue before they do nothing but scream with searing rage, isn't it? I mean, yeah, Broly has the I'll kill you line delivered really well from NAL. Oh, wait, this was NAL? Oh my, he also did a really good job. Although I have heard that this is out of character, but I can picture him saying this if he ever had to speak coherent sentences. Honestly, a common three-word phrase is really stretching it for a full sentence anyway, so I highly doubt it's that big of a deal. This also helps the choreography better in most ways. While the Loki Slam reference looks weak, Hulk's spin throw looks really solid, actually. Hell, just seeing a decent sense of power creep that may not be as good as Chuck vs. Segata, for example, is still well done. With Hulk's steps feeling heavy and destroying the ground he walks on, and then he smacks Broly with a plateau, which I think would be large town level-ish, given its size. But either way, it's definitely more impressive than Broly causing a crater by slamming Hulk into the ground. And then there's this clash, which is cracking the entire cannon they're fighting in, and even when they go into space, while they go into planetary destruction pretty quickly, it doesn't feel jarring since they're not in base form anymore, especially since Hulk's transformation is literally called World Breaker Hulk. After that, you see them casually wiping out a galaxy and later on breaking reality itself, which I'd assume is universal. Even if this isn't universal, Broly's last attack just outright destroys the universe anyway, and apparently resets it too? Okay, I'll concede, this kill is very abrupt, and Broly's last line being a quirky one-liner that has no implication of him being scared that he killed a man is odd to say less than the bare minimum. Throat. Sore. Bro, I've been recording for this video for 8 hours straight, get on my level! Though I do like seeing him back with the deer and smiling again, it's a solid ending note. And I think that the shot of Hulk's hand disintegrating with Broly's shocked expression was supposed to convey his horrors of killing a man, but his last line doesn't imply that. But then we get to the conclusion, and yeah, I know that there are people who vehemently disagree with the outcome, I think those disagreements are justified. But it's not in the way that you think. I think that the bigger issue is the over-reliance on scaling. Now I know that's funny coming from me, given what I just said about scaling, but here's the thing. If you're going to determine a winner almost entirely through scaling, you better do a good job of justifying that scaling. But unfortunately here, they kinda don't. Like they say that base Goku is nine times universal. Base Goku. Really. They never once explain how or when he managed to get to that point, so they just take it at face value and then slap the power multipliers on the higher forms as if it makes any sense to highball Goku and Gogeta this much. Maybe for Gogeta, I wouldn't know, but they literally show Super Saiyan God Goku in the Universe Shockwave clip. How am I supposed to believe that base Goku would stack up to that just off of their word alone? But on the other hand, there are other factors that they make in the conclusion to where their argument for Broly winning is still reasonable, and we need to go to the G1 blog for this. I feel like there might be some sort of misunderstanding as to why I give shoutouts to the G1 blogs, as there are those who say, You shouldn't always trust the G1 blogs because they don't always predict correctly. But like, that's not the point of them. The point of the G1 blogs are to give you a much bigger picture of the matchup. Not to mention that there is the occasional member of the blog who makes a verdict for the unpopular victor, and in this situation, it's this guy. While he directly says he thinks Hulk wins, he still plays devil's advocate for Broly. And he does this by saying that he should be comparable enough in stats and has other advantages in terms of speed, mobility, and ranged attacks. But unlike Death Battle, Phantom Falcon only added the multiplier from the universe shockwaves onward with no assumptions about base Goku. This made his logic work better than Death Battle's to me. But to the show's credit, the rest of the conclusion is good enough. They said that Broly had better arena control, and while Hulk didn't seem like he had that much trouble getting in, during the times when he did, Broly was still the dominant force the entire time, to a point where he was able to reset the distance between them. So, solid job, I guess. They also go in-depth on how Broly could bypass Hulk's immortality via disintegration. It's a valid case, to be sure. But the issue I have is that so much of their argument stems from that stupid assumption that they've never used before or since. But I don't think I could buy Broly being millions of times stronger than Hulk. But all in all, with everything in the picture, I think Hulk vs. Broly is a great episode with weirdly specific flaws. I enjoyed the analyses, but I couldn't get behind the scaling nonsense. I really like the fight, but the sound design, Hulk's immortality door, and Broly's first transformation are definitely flawed. I think that the conclusion is in-depth and well-made, but that scaling nonsense is the same level of headcanon bullshit as in Hulk vs. Doomsday. But I mean, I can't ignore how good the pros are. They really do make the fight for me. Enough for me to give this episode an 80 out of 100. Yes, this is a better episode than Hulk vs. Doomsday in damn near every conceivable way, and I'm tired of pretending it's not.
I'm gonna give it to you straight right now. This is gonna be the longest ending note I've given a death battle season. It's gonna be covering more than you think because, to me at least, I believe that Hulk vs. Broly is the perfect description of not just season 7, but death battle itself. Let's take it from the top, buying the implications of the first word from this episode, and get into the Marvel vs. DC oversaturation. Now, I get it, I get it. I get that there are many people who are tired of this conversation, just as much as the other side is tired of seeing Marvel and DC characters in general. And yes, I have seen his video on this issue. It's a great video. I don't have much to disagree with. But the thing is, I have never felt the same level of distaste towards Marvel and DC characters being on the show. Not even during this season. While it is true that Death Battle doesn't always cover the version of the character I'm familiar with, not only do they still get plenty of references, assuming that the specific version of the story is popular enough, but I think that another overlooked appeal of Death Battle is how they usually go out of their way to bring up some fascinating trivia that not a lot of people have brought up or that they may not even know about. Not the best time to bring it up given the season we're talking about, but that's still something they try to do way more often than they don't. Plus, at the end of the day, they're still talking about a character that has qualities I really like. So the problem has never bothered me because I get to learn more about characters I'm already familiar with, already have an appreciation and or respect for, and occasionally I'll get to hear about certain moments from stories that resonated with me. It's not often, but it can happen. But that said, I am still happy that people are bringing up the issue at all because I sure as hell wasn't gonna bring it up. But ultimately, while I don't think it's a big deal, I also don't think that it should be a reason as to why I should tell people to stop making it a big deal. Regardless of where you stand on this issue, the underlying issue is bias. Every human being on this planet is biased. I'm biased, you're biased, the first person to try and disprove this point in the comments is biased. There are people like me who are gonna feel biased towards characters they enjoy, and other people who are gonna feel disdain seeing another Marvel and or DC character taking up an episode slot. But that's okay. It only becomes an issue when you weaponize someone else's bias in an attempt to make yourself look better. Oh, and uh, before you call me out for doing exactly that, where do you think I learned this lesson, my dude? <laughs> in the chance that a matchup features a character they're not interested in, they don't have to enjoy it. Hell, they even have a right to skip the episode if they so please. As for how this ties into season 7, yes I'm biased towards this season. I get that it has its flaws. I understand. They bother me too. The animations just randomly had issues with things like bad puppet rigging and poor sound design. And the analyses either had an exclusive focus on story or versus stats. However, there's still so much to enjoy about it that I can overlook them, at least to an extent. There's a good reason why I insisted that season 7 was still way better than the first four seasons. Just look at my ranking for this season. It's not so dissimilar from season 5, and I still say that it was one of my favorite seasons of the show, especially since its lowest point still manages to remain above a 30 and higher than Venom vs. Bane. But at the same time, I don't think it's hard to understand why Death Battle immediately went back to 16 episode seasons instead of 20. But I still stand the majority of it is still good. Great even. Even if its high points are not as high as others, and even if it's supposedly the weakest season of modern Death Battle by far, and I'd also say that it's worse than seasons 5 and 6, season 7 still has a lot of great episodes, some of which were pretty overlooked. And even the ones that weren't overlooked had more interesting qualities that I thought were worth mentioning because I hadn't seen anyone else do it before. Thankfully, in more recent times, other people have been giving this season the credit it deserves because when compared to the rest of the series, it's still a welcome addition to Death Battle itself. We got a live-action episode that's really good, the long-overdue return of series like Star Wars and Darkstalkers, the appearance of Booster Goats, the existence of Blendary Sweet Baby, and plenty of other sleepers and surprises. Much like with Season 3, I have a feeling that more people are gonna begin to come around to its more overlooked episodes. But even with all of that, Death Battle is still able to take its criticism seriously, and it caused modern Death Battle to become something even better. And that's exactly what we're gonna get into with Season 8. On top of being an entire season, celebrating 10 years of Death Battle as well as its history. I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to see you subscribing to my channel! <laughs>